Hello, sons and daughters. This Sunday, Al should pull up a hay bale and gather round his old text, bring you spine chilling stories of cryptids, real life horror stories, and the downright spooky supernatural. Grab your moonshine and prepare to be plum scared. I stood at the edge of Pisgah National Park taking in the breathtaking vista before me. Towering trees reached towards the sky, their lush green foliage forming a canopy that bathed the forest floor in dappled sunlight. The air carried a crisp freshness, blending the scents of pine and earth, while the chorus of birdsong serenaded my senses. It was in this tranquil wilderness that I found solace and purpose as a park ranger. My name is Jakey, a father to two wonderful children and an occasional gardener in my off-duty hours. The wilderness was my sanctuary where I could reconnect with nature and provide a safe haven for visitors to enjoy the wonders of the park. One day, while tending to my gardening duties, I received an urgent call from the Forest Service. They informed me of a string of mysterious disappearances that had occurred within one of the park's campgrounds. Concerned and intrigued, I made my way to the Forest Service office, where they handed me a map detailing the marked areas where these disturbing incidents had taken place. As I studied the map, a memory stirred within me. There was a hidden cave nestled between the marked locations, unknown to most. It was a secret I had stumbled upon during my exploration of the park's depths. Fear mingled with excitement as I realized that this hidden cave might hold the key to unraveling the mystery. Without informing anyone of my intentions, I embarked on a covert journey towards the unmarked cave. My heart pounded in my chest, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I knew the risks involved, yet my duty as a park ranger propelled me forward. After what felt like an eternity of traversing the dense undergrowth, I finally arrived at the entrance of the cavern. A sense of foreboding hung in the air, as if the very nature of the place held secrets that dared not be spoken. I took a cautious step forward, my senses on high alert. And then I saw it. Before me stood a creature unlike anything I had ever encountered. It resembled a bear, but its form was distinctly humanoid. Its massive frame loomed over the remnants of its prey, gnawing on bones with an unsettling savagery. The sight sent shivers down my spine. Fear mingled with determination as I unholstered my rifle, aiming it at the cryptid. With a burst of courage, I pulled the trigger, the deafening crack of the gunshot filling the air. The creature let out a pained moan and swiftly disappeared into the depths of the forest, blending seamlessly with its surroundings. Driven by a mixture of duty and curiosity, I pursued the creature through the dense underbrush. But no matter how hard I tried, it remained elusive, disappearing like a ghost into the wilderness. When I returned to the cavern, a scene of horror awaited me. The lifeless bodies of fifteen missing campers lay strewn across the cold, rocky floor. A wave of sorrow washed over me, my heart heavy with the knowledge that I had not arrived in time to save them. I immediately contacted the police, informing them of the grisly discovery. They arrived swiftly, their expressions a mix of shock and disbelief. The weight of my responsibilities as a park ranger settled heavily upon my shoulders, knowing that I had failed those whose lives had been tragically cut short. My buddy, our dogs and I were on our way back from South Zapata Lake in the Rio Grande, Colorado. You pass a historic log cabin about one half mile and right after the first stream crossing, I noticed a strong smoky smell and could see a thin hair of smoke rising inside the log cabin's fire ring. We put it out with our Nalgene water and, similar to the top post, we're 100% sure the wind would have stoked it and the building would be ashes in the surrounding forest if we didn't. I've seen some pretty strange Canadian trailer park backwoods areas in the Big East River in Muskoka, Ontario. My trip was doing the meanest link route, 18-day, 
and we stayed near this cabin called the exotic Muskaka Hunting Land. And nothing notably uh, up up, just a lot of random machinery and items scattered about. Just the general hills have eyes feeling, I guess. Also, didn't help my friend was lost for seven hours the day after while taking the wrong turn on an ATV trail portaging the river bend. If alone, a TV driver didn't stumble upon him carrying his cedar canvas canoe, he would slept under it that night. We were about 15 days into a 21-day trip in Algonquin Provincial Park staying the night on Eustache Lake, a gorgeous deep lake nestled just outside the Petawa River, and were met by a lone traveler stating he'd embarked on a 30-day trip. He asked us if we had any sugar while on the river, and our head guide said we didn't have any extra provisions. A few hours pass, and he bumps into our crew again near the Eustache Portage. He asks again if we have any extra food supplies for him, and the head guide sternly said no. After this, he continued to paddle down the river. Our trip completes the 2.6 kilometers portage and makes camp at the biggest site on the lake, one of three. As we're cooking dinner, we see the solo. Traveler paddle in at dusk, and all the campers, myself included, got some super eerie vibes seeing him paddle in like a shadow paddling across the water. On my 45-day trip to Hudson Bay, we saw a polar bear eating a dead polar bear right near the bay. Spent the night in Fort Severn. The dead polar bear resembled an uncooked rotisserie chicken about the size of a A.V. Dutta. Once went camping in North Dakota, had a large group of wild bison come by into our campsite, which apparently was common according to the ranger. What was uncommon, however, was the dead coyote hanging off the horn of one of the big male's horn. Yes, apparently coyotes will try to attack the young calves if they think they can get a straggler. Yes, bison horns can gore a coyote pretty nastily. No, no one was brave enough to try and get the coyote corpse off the bison. Nor did the bison really seem to mind having a dead animal on its head. Years ago, when I was a kid, my cousins and I went exploring my aunt's property at the time. She once owned a shit, ton of land of mainly forest, so it was perfect for hiking around for literal miles and camping out. There was always something new to see, too including an old destroyed barn. It was pretty much all fallen apart, no roof with only a couple walls mostly standing. Inside the barn were a bunch of rusty metal things, maybe some kind of old farm equipment, but none of us knew what they were or what they were used for, and the skeletal remains of a horse. Not a complete skeleton, but lots of bones in the skull. None of us knew about the barn or the horse, not even my aunt or uncle. We just left everything there. But my one cousin buried the horse because she felt bad for it. I wish I could go back there again, but my aunt sold the property years ago, and it's mostly developments now with some patches of trees here and there. Hiking around on that land was something in my childhood I'll always cherish, but the horse skeleton always stuck with me. Why was it there? Was it abandoned and left to die? Or did it just die and whoever owned it never bothered to bury it? It was definitely the weirdest thing I've ever come across while hiking in the woods. I came across a girl's tent near the summit of my hike and thought nothing of it at first, but then I could hear whimpering from inside the tent. I asked if anything was okay, and she asked, are they gone yet? I asked who, and she just started crying really loudly. I opened the tent to find her naked, covered in dirt, and a bloody face as if someone punched her in the nose. Apparently, she was joking by herself near dawn to see the sun rise at the summit and set up her tent at a place where she could get a good view. A group of guys saw that she was alone and decided to rape her. 
I didn't get the details of the story, as that was all she told me. I called 911, and they dispatched a ranger to meet us on the trail. She was taken to the local hospital for a rape kit in her testimony. I quickly went home as well. The really sad part was I heard her say she just turned 18 a few days ago to the ranger when he asked for her aid. The poor girl was out there celebrating her 18th birthday by herself, only to have this happen to her. I was stationed in Idaho at Mountain Home, AFB. The air base is situated at the end of a long road going out into the desert, and at the time, it's been quite a while, so don't know what it's like today. There was only a gas station and a restaurant as you approach the base. Pretty lonely area at the time. As I passed the gas station, it was pretty late at night, around 11.30 p.m. or so. A pewter gray Volkswagen rabbit pulled out suddenly from the station, right in front of me, making me swerve to avoid hitting it. I was pretty P.O.'d, so took note of the description and the license plate. Just then, it vanished. I saw the driver in passenger's head enough to get a, a description. My wife just looked at me and said, did you see that? And we didn't speak about it anymore that night. The next day, I gave the license plate and description to a friend of mine who was a local cop in town and asked him to follow up on it. A few days later, he stopped by the house and asked me if I thought I was being funny and was pretty upset. Not my intention. A vehicle matching that plate and description with the two people inside that I had described had pulled out from that gas station one year ago at that day and time and had cut off another vehicle causing them to get hit and lose control, killing them. Both. It had happened before we moved there, and I had no prior knowledge of it. We all agreed to just avoid talking about it, but he was pretty shaken as well. My uncle was a lorry driver. He would go to many countries in Europe, transporting large kitchen appliances. He would go to many countries between Turkey and England, collecting the goods from Turkey and bringing them to the countries in Europe, and when he came to England, he would visit us. I'm not 100% sure on the details of his job. All I know is kitchen appliances, Turkey, European countries, England. As you know, a few years back, there was a huge flood of Syrian refugees trying to go to England specifically for some reason. Well, someone analyzed my uncle's route, decided it was the best route for the refugees, made the refugees pay all the money they had. When my uncle did a pit stop in Hungary, and he was sleeping on the side of the road in his lorry, 23 individual Syrian refugees entered his lorry. I'm not too sure, but I believe the lorry's storage units are airtight. Let's say it is a sick cunt took all the money off 23 refugees promising them they'd go to England, locked them in an airtight lorry storage unit. They stayed in there for 18, 24 hours until they were caught at the border of France. Now, it doesn't sound too scary, but imagine you're my uncle. Hi, uncle. You park your lorry in a ferry off to Dover in England. They call you down back to your lorry from the ship, saying they found something in the storage unit. Out comes off 23 people, all malnourished, struggling to breathe, sweaty, bewildered, poor refugees. I once went up to a small mountain town in Colorado with my dad to stay for a few days. We have a cabin up there, and so we had a place to stay. After we got settled in and were in our beds, my dad opened all the windows. They had screens to let natural air blow through the cabin. Two of these windows were in the bedroom with us, one of them very large and was directly above the main bed where I slept. Two weird things happened that night. I was kind of restless that night so I woke up at random times before falling asleep again. At one point I woke up, and it was sometime early in the morning, and I heard rustling outside. I didn't think anything of it until I realized they were footsteps. 
I started to listen a little more closely and realized they didn't sound like an animal walking, but more like something standing up and kind of shuffling through the leaves. I was a little freaked out because it sounded like it was right outside the window, but I started to lose consciousness again and concluded it may have been a deer. Some time passed and I woke up again to hear more rustling. Then suddenly a dog's howl, like a wolf or a coyote howling right outside the window. In my head, I just thought, nope. Then there was another howl, and another, and another, and another. More and more howling just kept popping up, and it kept getting louder and louder. I was too tired to be freaked out, so I just grabbed another pillow and slammed it on my head to cover my ears. I told myself, no, I don't have time for this, and tried to block out the noise to go back to sleep. It eventually died down, and I passed out again. The next morning, I was telling my dad about the rustling. As I started to tell him about the howling, he piped up and said, Did you also hear that howling? I said, Yeah, before he gave a nervous chuckle about it and went back to his stuff. Honestly, I'm more freaked out about what the rustling and walking prior to the howling could have been, because windows are about normal height, and someone who's tall could easily have looked in on a sleeping. I was working at a mall under construction, and it was slowly becoming winter where I am. So that means 5 p.m. the sun goes down and 6 p.m. is dark. It was after 5 p.m. and the mall didn't have lights. So we had to work by our work light. We were the last guys on site, and because he is first aid, my boss and I could work alone. At one point, my boss asked me to go do something in the bathrooms at the back. The bathrooms were down this long hallway, this really long hallway, lots of turns and such with no lights besides my phone. So I got to the one bathroom and I was underneath the sink just trying to level out the counters when my phone crashed and it had to restart. I noticed I had like 4% battery so I turned off the light and figured I'd open a door further down the hallway and it would give me some light that I could get used to. At this point, I just needed to silicon the counter to the cabinet so I didn't need much light. I hear something down the hallway after like five minutes. I figured it was just my boss, so I continued work. It was super dark at this point, so any light from the outside was pretty much gone. I looked over the doorway, and I'm, I'm under the sink across the room, and in the doorway I can barely make out a huge person standing there. My boss was five feet six. Uh, it wasn't him. I laid there pretty freaked out, and then the figure moved, and I asked if someone was there. Then I heard running, pitch black footsteps hurriedly running away from me. I freaked out, so I went to call my boss, because he was like ten minutes away from me, and I didn't know where we was at the time. But my phone had died, so now I have to make it back to my boss. But there's someone in between me and him, because the dude ran off away from the door. That walk back to my boss was probably one of the freakiest things because I was expecting someone to jump out and stab me. I made it back to my boss and he's like, oh, you're finished, and I told him my story. So he told me that we can just finish up tomorrow and we decided to leave. We packed our tools and brought them with us. The next day there was a toolbox meeting for all of the trades to attend and some toolboxes had been stolen as well as copper pipe. The door that I had opened for light the previous day led to an area where there was a lot of HIVAC units. However, the area wasn't very sealed off. You could walk in off the street. What I think happened is some dudes were stealing copper pipe in that area, and when I opened the door, they got spooked. So someone came in to check it out, and when they heard me ask, they booked it and went into the mall. When I left, uh, they must have had another guy come in and help get some toolboxes, cause a big one was missing. I was super out of shape at the time, and I was recovering from a dislocated pelvis that had been set recently, so it freaked me out, cause if that dude fought me, I would have died immediately. It was a chilly autumn night and my girlfriend and I had just finished watching a movie at the local theater. 
as we walked to my car. We couldn't help but feel the eerie atmosphere that enveloped the town. The moon was full, casting an ethereal glow on the deserted streets. As I drove my girlfriend home, we chatted about the movie and our plans for the weekend. The conversation was light and easy, providing a welcome distraction from the unsettling ambience outside. As we turned onto a particularly dark stretch of road, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Suddenly, without warning, a transparent figure appeared in the middle of the road. It was a girl with long flowing hair and a white dress that seemed to shimmer in the moonlight. I froze, unable to react, and before I knew it, my car had passed right through her. I glanced nervously in the rearview mirror, but there was no trace of the girl. I knew I hadn't hit anything, at least not anything physical. In a desperate attempt to make sense of what had just happened, my mind raced to find a logical explanation. Steam from a sewer. Fog. A plastic bag. I must be going crazy, I thought. The silence in the car was deafening as I struggled to find the words to say. Finally, my girlfriend broke the silence with a trembling voice. Was that a ghost? I swallowed hard, my heart pounding in my chest. I... I don't know. I thought I was just imagining things, but if you saw it too, we exchanged a look of disbelief and fear as the reality of our encounter sunk in. We had both seen the same apparition, and there was no denying it now. That night, our drive home was filled with uneasy silence, punctuated only by our racing thoughts. I lived in a big 1840s colonial house with three of my friends for a while. It was set back in 50-plus acres of state wildlife property, and in, it was a gorgeous house. The bedrooms were all upstairs and all lined up down the hall. Our third night in the house, right about 30 minutes after we had all sort of called it a night, my doorknob rattled like someone was fiddling with it. Then I heard the door next to mine rattle, and the next, and the next, all the way down the hall, one at a time. The next morning, one of my housemates asked why I was messing with the doors, since she had asked the two guys in the house, and neither of them knew what she was talking about. One night I woke up with an intense urge to get out of bed, like my brain screaming at me to get up. I laid still for a while, thinking maybe I had been woken up by a noise, but it was around 3 a.m. and dead quiet. I went into the hallway, and as soon as I walked out into the hall, all of my roommates opened their doors and came out too. We were all woken up, but no one heard anything, and they had the same urgent get-up feeling I did. We just shrugged and went back to sleep. Weird things would happen there. Strange objects would show up in the basement or crawl space like old, old suitcases or a kid's rocking chair once a vase. Just random stuff. You would occasionally hear footsteps running down the bedroom hall and down the stairs if you were in the living room below. I could go on. That house was really strange. Never felt threatened. Just weird. In the aftermath of the world's devastation, our small community struggled to survive. Food was scarce, and the once familiar landscapes had transformed into a mutated wasteland. As one of the skilled hunters in our group, it was my responsibility to venture into the unknown and bring back the resources we desperately needed. We set off a small band of hardened hunters, each an expert in their own right. But I had a knack for improvising traps and weapons that often made the difference between life and death. As we journeyed further into the mutated wasteland, we encountered creatures that defied belief. Some were grotesque amalgamations of animals we had once known, while others were entirely new species born of the catastrophe. We fought and killed many of these monstrous creatures, and I devised a series of creative and deadly methods to dispatch them. One such trap involved rigging a tripwire to a deadfall, crushing a reptilian beast that boasted scaly armor and razor-sharp teeth. Another time I crafted a makeshift spear from a broken tree branch and took down a massive six-legged creature with the precision of a skilled marksman. 
But our most harrowing encounter came when we were ambushed by the most powerful and deadly creature we had ever faced. The beast stood on four muscular legs, its twisted form covered in spiked armored plating. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent intelligence that sent chills down our spines. We were outmatched, and one by one, my fellow hunters fell to the creature's relentless onslaught. As the last surviving hunter, I knew I had to find a way to defeat the beast. Drawing upon my knowledge of the creature's habits and weaknesses, I devised a plan. I studied the predator's scent, marking habits and chemical communication, using my findings to create a synthetic pheromone to lure the creature into a trap. By placing the pheromone in strategic locations, I was able to manipulate the predator's movements and create an opportunity to strike. The beast approached the trap, its keen senses drawn to the irresistible scent. As it closed in, I sprang into action, launching my carefully prepared attack that finally brought the creature down. Exhausted and battered, I knew my fallen comrades would not have died in vain. When I returned to our community, I brought not only much, needed resources, but also tales of our harrowing encounters and a newfound appreciation for the power of human ingenuity. Our world might have changed beyond recognition, but the resilience and adaptability of the human spirit remained a force to be reckoned with. Yesterday, me and a friend decided to go to the nearby woods to smoke a bowl and hang out. This wooded area is rather small, but has lots of dense brush, giving us lots of cover. I brought my brand new Glocket tool and a can of Sabre Red Ock, just in case. We went into the woods a decent distance and smoked a bowl. I was going to repack the bowl when I suddenly heard some very loud and very close footsteps right behind me. I didn't see the guy since I was preoccupied with grabbing my backpack, but my friend did. He described him as maybe a five feet eleven white male in his fifties wearing a white shirt and a cap. He had snuck up behind us in a wooded area full of dense brush and dry leaves until he was a mere five yards away, at which point he started to speed walk towards us without saying a word. We both made it out of there and took cover behind a rotting log where we joked about how Sam Fisher just attacked us. I personally feel like someone wouldn't be that stealthy just to sneak up on two kids smoking weed, and that he may have had some bad motive or something. I can post pictures of the location if you guys request it. In 1992 or 93, I hiked up Mule Mountain from a ridge on the southeast end. I was about one quarter mile from the mountain, walking through a small bunch grass meadow enclosed with old growth. First, elk hunting. It was unusually quiet, so I was walking as softly as possible. I had stopped to listen and watch. When off to my right from deep in the timber, I heard very clearly and loudly a sound like someone blowing across the mouth of a soda bottle. It wasn't a bear woofing. There were three split-second bursts in rapid succession, followed by a loud guttural gurgling call similar to a deep trill. At sixty years of age, I have spent a majority of my life in the Oregon woods, but have never heard these sounds before or since. It stirred what I call the caveman response, a deep primeval fear that immediately throws you into the fight-or-flight mode. I left by the shortest route possible back to my truck. I have never returned to that area. It's as if my instincts tell me not to, that there's something that didn't want me there. My buddy and I had a tradition of hiking deep into the backwoods where human footprints were few and far between. A silent, serene world where our conversations were the only disturbance to the constant symphony of nature. That's where our story begins, way out there with nobody in sight. One particular evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I began to gather some wood for a campfire, picking up sticks here and there. 
My eyes landed on a stick that stood out from the rest. It was about five feet long, about three inches wide. The perfect size for a walking stick. Excitement coursed through me as I picked it up. It was straight and mostly smooth, the ideal companion for long hikes. What was really surprising was that one end was smoother than the rest. A thought bubbled up in my mind. Had I stumbled upon a fellow hiker's discarded walking stick, my fingers traced the meticulously whittled end, admiring the craftsmanship. But as my eyes took in the details, I realized with an escalating sense of disbelief that it wasn't a handle. Not even close. It was unmistakably and irrevocably a penis. A phallic masterpiece carved into the end of this seemingly innocent stick. I was holding a literal dick stick. My initial shock quickly morphed into odd fascination. This wasn't just a quick, crude job done out of adolescent boredom. This was a work of art, carved with purpose, precision, and, bizarrely enough, affection. The details were intricate, right down to the carefully etched veins running along its length. Whoever had created this had invested hours, if not days, crafting this unique piece of art. Stunned, I showed it to my buddy, whose wide-eyed expression mirrored my own. We burst into laughter, the echoing sound a stark contrast to the silence of the surrounding wilderness. There, under the stars, we shared a moment of surreal hilarity, the product of someone's bizarre pastime. From that day forward, our hikes took on an extra dimension. Every stick picked up was scrutinized, and our campfire stories had a new, undeniably strange champion. The forest, it seemed, held secrets far more peculiar than we could have ever imagined. I work in the outdoor field and lead trips regularly. I once led a trip to the top of Mount Stringer in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top in about six miles from the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor. We were camping out on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other co-instructor went to bed in their tents. I chose to spend the night in a hammock that night. I was really into a book I was reading, so I stayed up and read until about 10.30 p.m. I turned my headlamp off to settle in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the moon and from the position I was in. I could see down the trail we had hiked to get to the top. I laid there enjoying the scenery and noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in the area, so I perked up. As it got closer, I could tell it was a person. We were in the middle of nowhere, and there was someone hiking up the trail with no headlamp or any gear. I was just frozen, watching this person move closer to our camp. They arrived at the top of the mountain where we were and just stopped. I watched as what appeared to be a man surveyed our camp. I really could only see the outline of him. He stood there for what seemed like thirty minutes, but may have been ten. He then turned, sat down under a tree facing our camp. He was sitting up in a way that I knew he wasn't trying to sleep. He just sat there, staring at our camp. I had no idea what to do. I decided to wait it out. I waited, just staring at the man while he stared at my camp. This went on until about 3.30 a.m. Then he stood up, took a moment to survey my camp a few minutes longer, and then went back down the trail he came upon. I, to this day, have no idea what that was all about, but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip. Working the night shift as a way of skewing your perception of time. Before you know it, the world is celebrating Christmas and you're just finishing up work at 1 a.m. That's exactly where I found myself one Christmas morning, about to embark on a six-hour drive north to spend the holiday with my parents. This wasn't a bustling cityscape. This was the rural South Island of New Zealand, a landscape punctuated by small towns and vast stretches of untouched nature. It was a kind of place where traffic was sparse on a regular day, let alone at 1 a.m. on Christmas morning. 
Throughout my drive, I passed only a handful of cars, fellow night owls making their own solitary journeys. About halfway through my trip, I reached a stretch of road that was truly isolated. The mountains seemed to reach out and touch the sea with a narrow road carved into the cliffside. On one side, the towering cliffs rose into darkness. On the other, the roaring sea crashed against the rocky shore, its ebb and flow a steady soundtrack to my journey. It was on this remote road, some twenty kilometers from the nearest town, that my headlights illuminated in an unusual sight, a man walking in the middle of nowhere. The pitch black night, the eerie sound of the waves, and the intermittent sea fog created an almost otherworldly backdrop to this lone figure. What made the scene even stranger was what he was carrying, a cheap blow-up doll slung over his shoulder. There were no houses in sight, and given the steep mountains and the proximity of the sea, it was clear there were no suitable places for a dwelling until I reached the next town. This man was truly in the middle of nowhere, and his presence was inexplicably unsettling. Friends have since asked me if I stopped to see if he needed help, suggesting he might have been left behind by someone. But in the face of that bizarre spectacle, under the vast expanse of the starry sky, with the relentless sea as my only companion, there was no way I was stopping. I drove on the image of the man and his blow-up doll growing smaller in my rear-view mirror. Even now, the memory lingers, a lone figure in the darkness, a curious anomaly against the rugged beauty of rural New Zealand. I still don't know who he was or why he was there. All I knew is that six. Our drive was the longest I've ever experienced, and I'll never forget that Christmas morning. When I served in the Navy, my role was in aviation. While deployed, I had the opportunity to be on the flight deck during the day. The Navy is renowned for its utmost vigilance in protecting the airspace above aircraft carriers. Any approaching aircraft is met with swift action, with alert jets launching to ensure the safety and security of the carrier. One morning, something caught my attention as I looked up. Along with my fellow sailors, I witnessed an aircraft in the distance. It had a distinct red star on its vertical stabilizer and was calmly cruising directly above our flight deck. It was an unusual sight because we were often reminded of how, how the Russians are always testing our airspace and the need for us to respond promptly to any such incursions. However, this particular aircraft seemed to be peacefully soaring a few thousand feet above our flight deck defying the expected reaction. The incident left us intrigued and sparked discussions among the crew. It was a reminder of the complex dynamics and constant surveillance that define naval operations, even when unexpected occurrences challenge our preconceived notions. I live at the base of Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs, surrounded by the majestic mountains. During the spring and summer, I spend a lot of my time exploring these rugged terrains. However, the scariest experience I've ever had in those mountains occurred during a severe lightning storm that put me and my two buddies in grave danger. It all started when five of us embarked on a mountain adventure, driving in a Jeep Wrangler in a Hummer. We received a phone call from someone who said they would meet us at our destination. Perfect, we thought. They provided us with directions to the camping spot and an alternate meet-up location in case they couldn't find it. A simple spot easily accessible off the main road before the dense forest. This way, one of us could guide the third car back once enough time had passed, accounting for the loss of cell service in the area. Everything seemed well planned until the storm hit. If you've never experienced hail season on the front range of Colorado, you can't truly comprehend how swiftly a devastating storm can brew and dissipate. Out of nowhere, a gentle drizzle transformed into a torrential downpour, accompanied by hail the size of marbles. In the blink of an eye, our biggest predicament became apparent. The jeep, already packed with camping gear, 
a valuable telescope and various supplies, only had two seats. There was no space for three people, no matter how we rearranged our belongings. Unspoken, but understood, we refused to leave anyone outside in the hail, and the thought of leaving just one person behind was out of the question. We were in this together, as the rain pelted us and the hail grew more intense. The real danger revealed itself. The electricity in the air crackled ominously. Nestled within a canyon, the thunder reverberated, echoing off the rocky walls, making it seem as if Zeus himself had discovered my transgressions against Calliope and was unleashing his wrath. The deafening noise sent chills down our spines. Desperate for shelter, we rummaged through the jeep and found a blue tarp. With some quick thinking and resourcefulness, we managed to tie it between a few trees, creating a makeshift refuge from the rain. But it was one lightning bolt in particular that forever altered my perception of the Rockies' power. Approximately fifty feet from our huddled shelter, a fence marked the boundaries of a vast ranch. Though we couldn't see the ranch itself, the fence stood prominently, accompanied by a large pillar adorned with a sign warning trespassers of potential consequences, including being shot. And then it happened. While we anxiously waited for the storm to subside amid countless flashes of lightning and thunderous booms, a colossal bolt of electricity arched around the mountain we were nestled against. It struck the post with a force that seemed to hold it captive for a seemingly eternal two or three seconds. The bolt was enormous, and our horror knew no bounds as it occurred less than one hundred feet away. The most disturbing part was what followed. For a fleeting ten seconds after the bolt dissipated, the trespassing sign glowed a molten red and emitted a deafening vibration that cut through the rest of the storm. Our friends in the Hummer returned about forty-five minutes later, finding us in a clear sky with temperatures soaring back to a balmy seventy-five degrees. The storm had vanished as if it were never there, leaving us shaken by the power we had witnessed. I walked the trails of the park with a heavy heart, my footsteps echoing the burden of my past. As a dedicated park ranger named Larry, I had dedicated my life to preserving this vast wilderness, but my personal journey had been marred by tragedy. A single father and widower, I carried the weight of loss on my shoulders, a constant reminder of the fragility of life. One fateful day, as I ventured into the depths of the park, my attention was drawn to a hidden alcove tucked away amidst the towering trees. Curiosity peaked. I cautiously approached, sensing there was something more to discover. Nestled within the moss-covered rocks, I discovered a weathered box containing a collection of old audio tapes. Intrigued and filled with a mix of apprehension and curiosity, I dusted off the tapes and found a vintage tape player to listen to the mysterious recordings. As the haunting melodies and static-filled whispers filled the air, I embarked on a journey into darkness unaware of the secrets that awaited me. The audio recordings told tales of a long-lost camper, a young woman who had vanished without a trace. The chilling accounts described encounters with a creature, a monstrous being resembling a big foot like creature lurking in the depths of the forest. The creature had claimed the lives of over twenty unsuspecting campers, leaving a trail of fear and mystery in its wake. As the tapes played on, the puzzle pieces began to fall into place, and the truth emerged from the depths of the woods. The voice from tape said exact coordinates of where this creature was. The sinister presence I had sensed was real, a creature of unimaginable power and darkness. It had slumbered for years, hidden from the world, but now it awakened once more, hungering for blood and vengeance. Haunted by the past and driven by a sense of duty, I knew I had to confront my own demons and uncover the truth before history repeated itself. Armed with my ranger skills and an unwavering determination, I delved deeper into the darkness, desperate to protect both the visitors and the fragile balance of nature. Night after night I patrolled the park, my senses heightened, searching for signs of the creature's presence. 
With each step, the weight of responsibility grew heavier as the lives of countless campers hung in the balance. I followed the trail of tragedy and fear, determined to bring an end to the creature's reign of terror. As the final battle drew near, my heart raced with a mixture of fear and resolve. I stood on the precipice, ready to face the creature that had haunted my dreams and claimed the lives of the innocent. In the heart of the forest, amidst the deafening silence, I confronted the beast, knowing that my own survival was not guaranteed. In a fierce struggle, we clashed. The creature's inhuman strength pitted against my determination to protect those I held dear. With every ounce of strength, I fought back, unleashing a storm of courage and resilience. The battle raged on, nature's fury echoing our struggle. In a moment of desperate determination, I managed to find a weakness in the creature's defenses. With a swift strike, I wounded the beast near its heart, eliciting a guttural roar of pain. It retreated, vanishing into the shadows, wounded but not defeated. As the sun rose over the park, casting its gentle glow upon the battered landscape, I emerged victorious, the savior of the woods. But the scars of battle ran deep, not only on the surface, but within my soul. I had confronted the darkness, faced my own demons, and ensured that the tragedy of the past would not be repeated. With renewed purpose, I continued my role as a dedicated park ranger, protecting the visitors from both the seen and unseen dangers that lurked within the wilderness. And as I watched over the serene beauty of the park, a glimmer of hope emerged, reminding me that even in the face of darkness, light could prevail. I was camping with my buddy, and we pulled into a campsite in the middle of nowhere. For some reason, there was an oil painting of a woman at this campsite. Thought that was weird, but whatever, it's the woods, right? We go to bed that night in the bed of my truck. At some point, my buddy wakes halfway up and goes, what the F is that? I, thinking it was just an animal or something, tell him to stew and go back to sleep. Next morning, we wake up, and there are small barefoot footprints all around our camp. Like a small girl or child had wandered up to the window, I take the cab of my truck all around camp and left. And I know they showed up that night because they wear over my tire marks in the dirt. As we snoop around camp, we notice drag marks in the dirt. Try to follow them, but they eventually disappear. Who the F was snooping around my camp at all hours of the night? I got baked off my face on a hike in Palm Springs, made a wrong turn on the descent, and wound up going down a much steeper part of the mountain. As I know to always keep my head on a swivel out in nature, I was on high alert, looking up roughly 100 yards or meters away. Thing Big Head pokes out, and it's a mountain lion. I immediately thought, oh, this is where I die. Then some of the Dave Attenborough nature specials I watched kicked in. They are typically skittish, unless they perceive you as prey. So I made myself bigger with my arms up, growling as I continued to go down the mountain. It just kept moving side to side, observing me. I watched it every two steps I took. Eventually it gave up on me, and I was able to will myself down. Going in the ADK, a couple of peaks, forget when, other than during active bear season. When settling down for the evening night, another hiker was camped about 100 feet from me. I was looking at him go, cooking salmon, sitting in his tent entrance, brushing his teeth, and spitting it out on his tent's doorstep, along with the cooking leftover liquids, left food out, etc., I'm being cautious in putting stuff away, like 200 feet away from my tent. We chat and tell him about bear prevention. Blah, blah, blah. Middle of the night, bear noises and growls and screaming in the whole nine yards. Everything clams down and I go back to sleep. In the morning, the other guy had barely slept. His tent was torn apart. Had a surprise visit overnight.
So I was camping with about five friends at this lake on the first night on a backpacking trip. There was a different group of backpackers camping across the lake. When night fell, my group went to bed rather early while the group across the lake was being loud and having themselves a good time. About an hour later, right as I was nodding off, a gunshot went off really close to our camp. Within 100 feet, it was a pitch black moonless light. We all stuck our heads out from our tent saying what the hell was that while looking for flashlight from the person who did it and listening for noises. We never saw the light or heard anything. The group across the lake immediately stopped being loud and went to be bed ASAP, probably thinking it was our way of telling them to shut up. We never found out who shot the gun. Not disturbing per se, but left me feeling uneasy. My boyfriend and I were coming down the peak of a day-long mountain hike when we passed a group of young girls going up towards the summit. We make it further down the trail as the sun is starting to set and the chill is setting in and we start to get nervous thinking about them and how unprepared they looked. Olga pants and crop tops, no warm clothes or backpacks. I was in terrible shape so when, when we finally got back to the parking lot late in the evening there was just our car and one other car left which we assume had to be theirs. The next morning we have a bad feeling and a sense of guilt and we go back to the parking lot and see that the same car is still there. My boyfriend calls the rangers and lets them know the whole story and describe the girls. They honestly didn't seem very concerned and we never heard any more info after that. I still worry about those girls and hope they are okay. My name is Frank K, and I've always been a skeptic when it comes to anything unexplained. That was until I was taken to a site where a hunter was charged by a creature he claimed to be a seven and a half-foot Bigfoot. This experience has left me questioning everything I thought I knew. It all started when my friend, a fellow hunter, called me up and insisted that I come with him to the location where he had experienced something terrifying. He said that he had shot a buck, but before he could even approach it, a massive creature emerged from the woods and charged at him. He barely managed to escape, and he wanted me to see the evidence for myself. I agreed to go with him, mostly out of curiosity and the assumption that he must have been exaggerating or mistaken about what he saw. We packed our gear and headed out to the site. As we arrived, I noticed a strange tension in the air a feeling I couldn't quite put my finger on. My friend led me to the spot where he had shot the buck, and what I saw there left me speechless. The deer was mutilated, its body broken in ways that seemed unnatural and brutal. Nearby, there were broken trees and tracks that didn't resemble any animal I'd had ever seen. To top it off, the deer carcass was partially covered with sticks, as if someone or something had tried to hide it. My friend, visibly shaken, recounted his experience with the creature. He said it looked like a mix between a man and a dog with massive hulking limbs and a snarling canine-like face. He called it a dogman, a term I had never heard before. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but the evidence in front of me was hard to ignore. As we investigated the site further, we noticed a pungent, musky smell in the air. It was then that we heard a low growl echoing through the woods. My friend and I exchanged worried glances, suddenly aware that we were not alone. We decided it was best to leave the area immediately, not wanting to risk another encounter with the dogman. That day changed everything for me. I've spent countless hours researching dogman sightings and encounters since then, trying to understand what we experienced. It was an early Saturday morning, and I found myself at the Malala River campsite, about 20 miles south of Malala, Oregon. I was there with a group of friends from the local TV station, filming a piece on the great outdoors and the beauty of the Pacific Northwest. Little did I know that our tranquil weekend getaway would soon turn into a harrowing experience that none of us would ever forget. We had spent the day hiking, fishing, and enjoying the scenic beauty of the area. 
As the sun began to set, we gathered around the campfire, sharing stories and laughter late into the night. Eventually, one by one, we retreated to our tents, exhausted from a long day of adventure. I woke suddenly around three or four in the morning, disoriented and unsure of what had roused me from my slumber. That's when I heard it, a low guttural growling sound that seemed to come from just outside my tent. I lay there frozen in fear, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of the noise. Then I heard the screams. I scrambled out of my sleeping bag and rushed outside, only to see that the tent belonging to some of my TV crew friends was being violently shaken by an unseen force. The growling grew louder, and I could hear the terror in my friends' voices as they cried out for help. Gathering my courage, I picked up a nearby flashlight and shone it towards the tent. The shaking stopped abruptly, and I caught a glimpse of a large, dark figure retreating into the shadows of the forest. The growling faded away, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. My friends emerged from their tent, visibly shaken and pale. They told me that they had been awoken by the growling and had felt something powerful and menacing pressing against their tent, as if trying to get inside. We couldn't determine what had attacked them, but we knew we needed to leave the campsite immediately. As the first light of dawn broke through the darkness, we hastily packed our belongings and made our way back to civilization. I worked as a ranger in Northern Carolina for well over 20 years. I've had my fair share of weird happenings and some gruesome ones too. I found multiple dead bodies during my time working there. All of the killers were luckily brought to justice by the police. But it's not the killings that got me to quit my job and never come back. It was something a little more unexplainable. Something so weird, in fact, that I sometimes still wonder if it was all just a dream or vision or indeed a real event. I'll tell you exactly what I saw from the beginning. It was the middle of August and the sun was scorching the ground with its rays. Not many people visited during the day for obvious reasons. I hated when I had to leave my guard hut to make a tour of the park. That would usually include a lot of sweating and feeling like somebody is roasting you in a pan. I was already pretty beat during my first two hours drinking more than enough water to try and keep hydrated. As it was already time to go out for the third and final tour of the day, because for the next shift another ranger was going to replace me, I went on a walk. About halfway through, I started feeling dizzy and a little lost. I felt weaker and weaker up until I could not stand anymore. I sat under a nearby tree to try and get some rest and regain strength, but the sun and heat were too strong. I began seeing things and just felt a little too real. The tall, shadowy figures began emerging from behind trees, walking slowly and aimlessly. I couldn't move or breathe properly, so I just sat there staring back at them. In a minute, there were so many of them, I lost count, and more began emerging straight from the ground. I was confident that I had had a severe sunstroke. They didn't seem to pay any attention to me at first. They just wandered around and let out horrific screams of pain like somebody being cooked alive. Just then, one of those figures had noticed me slowly making its way. It was over eight feet tall, so it had to crouch down to get close to me. I was petrified, but I didn't possess the strength to do anything. The figure didn't stop screaming for a split second either. It just crouched next to me and put its hand on my cheek. I started to burn. I lost consciousness. Other rangers found me passed out on the ground about an hour later, getting me to an ambulance. I was relieved for a minute. But when I got up from the bed, I saw that red burning handprint. It terrified me so much I had to resign. None of my bosses or colleagues ever believed me. I guess I can't say I blame them. I have worked many different jobs in my lifetime. Starting as a janitor, I worked on a farm for about two years. At one point later, as a PI teacher in a high school, I was even an officer before eventually moving to New Jersey and eventually getting a job as a park ranger in the Pine Barrens. 
I had moved to New Jersey to be closer to my family. The job didn't seem to be hard. I'd work four days a week, and I would spend all my time in the park. The other three would be my days off. Now, I haven't worked for the park for a very long time, and I'm about to tell you why. I think I lasted a year, and maybe even less than that. I had a series of very strange things happen to me there, and the final straw made me quit my job as soon as I got the chance. I began working at Pine Barrens in April of that year. I was introduced to the job in the park by the park services. The place is humongous. It stretches over the area that is 22% of New Jersey. My job was to patrol a certain area, make sure everything was in order. If you've ever visited the Pine Barrens, you would know that abandoned buildings and towns are scattered throughout the park. I would clock in on a Tuesday, work through to Friday, and Saturday through Monday. The first couple of weeks went smooth. I was getting familiar with the woods and my route. The third week was when my first spooky experience happened. It was Thursday evening. I was going my regular route. The park was buzzing with nature sounds. There were no people anywhere that I'd run into that day. I know that sometimes kids like to wander the park at night, looking for ghosts or just a secluded place to hang, but I had not seen any of them either. I was taking little mental notes of my surroundings, and I noticed the humming and buzzing. I couldn't tell where it was coming from at first. I looked around for a few minutes and still nothing. The noise was beginning to get closer, which is when I realized it was sneering me from above. I looked up and saw three bright lights moving in a circle, almost as if they were spiraling down towards me. Instinctively, I ducked and ran as fast as I could. It probably ran for a couple hundred feet before turning around to see the lights were still there. They were not. There was no humming now either. I dropped to the ground trying to gather my composite and catch my breath. I also tried to make sense of what had happened five minutes prior. I do believe in aliens, even though I never had an encounter before. I had no clue what else it could have been. So, I kind of been in agreement with myself. Those were aliens. And I wouldn't think about that anymore. And it was okay for a while. I've never seen those lights after that. My second experience happened about five months after I began working in the park. I was again going on my regular route. It was now about 7 p.m. And at this point, since it was October, the sun was getting very low in the sky, and it was getting dark. The route was clear. Everything seemed to be in order until I noticed something lurking behind the trees about a hundred yards away from me. At first it looked like a person, maybe a man about five, seven. I thought it might have been some college kid playing a prank trying to scare me. I saw his shoulder peeking behind a tree. I yelled out that nobody is allowed to be in the woods this late in this time of year. He didn't move. Only after I shouted the third time, he had finally moved in front of the tree. I could take a good look at him. When I saw him, I nearly had a heart attack. He was dressed in dirty, torn-up clothing, but the most disturbing thing about him was his head, or lack of one, I should say. I looked at him, not knowing if I should ask what he was, what happened to him, or just bolt out of there as fast as I could. I didn't either. For a solid three minutes, I froze. Even though I noticed he had begun moving closer to me, I still could not lift a finger. He started running up to me. As he was getting closer, I realized he was also translucent. This was a poltergeist. Now, when it comes to an alien, I'm a believer. When it comes to ghosts, however, I was very skeptical and sarcastic at times that anybody would talk about ghosts or demons or any alleged paranormal activity. I moved to the right a couple of steps as he was running straight at me and he just vanished. I turned around to see where he had gone but there was no trace of him, only a vapory trail of mist, just what looked like a cloud of dust, almost settling. After that second incident, I decided that all my love for nature in the outdoors, and as much as I loved being a ranger, staying here was not worth it. This hot mess of a place was not worth me, going literally insane for, trying to keep working there. I called in the next day and explained the situation. They told me that something like this had already happened for their previous rangers. They tried to convince me to stay on the job for longer and doubled my pay, but I refused. 
I would not risk losing my own mind. Back in 2003, I was part of a seasoned hunting troop of 21 people. We were out in the wilderness looking for elk. Our journey led us to a cave near a national park, an unexpected finding on our hunting expedition. As we ventured into the cave, something peculiar started happening. Our flashlights flickered erratically, and the GPS devices we carried for navigation began to malfunction. The cave was more than just an empty hole in the mountainside. We discovered a hidden tunnel, a small, obscured passageway that lead to an expansive cavern. The moment we entered the cavern, a chilling sensation washed over us. The air felt heavy, charged with an oppressive presence that caused an inexplicable surge of fear in even the bravest amongst us. Our instincts screamed at us to leave, but the explorer in us kept us rooted. Then we saw it. The figure, tall and pale, a grotesque distortion of the human form, standing at the edge of our light's reach. Its eyes glowed a sinister red, piercing the darkness, locking on to us. Panic seized us, a raw, primal terror that overrode all sense of reason. We turned tail and fled, driven by the overwhelming need to escape. In the years that followed, my fellow hunters, one by one, fell ill. They all succumbed to different forms of cancer, as if whatever we had encountered in that cave had marked us, cursed us. I am the sole survivor carrying the memory of that terrifying encounter. The records of our hunting expedition were lost, probably destroyed, leaving no trace of our encounter with the unknown. But I know what we saw, what we experienced. It was real, as real as the deaths of my fellow hunters, as real as the fear that still haunts me. A few years back, my two friends and I embarked on a casual hike to a well-known spot in our area. It was a stunning 150-foot waterfall, a rewarding sight after an uphill trek of about 45 minutes. This particular day, instead of heading directly to the waterfall, we decided to go bouldering around its base. The area was brimming with intriguing rock formations and tranquil pools formed by the waterfall's runoff. This bouldering trail was off the beaten path, not something many hikers ventured onto from the main trail. As we navigated the rocky landscape, we came across a chilling sight. A young woman, just 22 years old, lying face down in the mud. Both her legs were grotesquely broken, bone piercing through skin and what were clearly compound fractures. She had no cell phone, no water, no food, and no means to keep warm. Immediately we dialed 911 and shared our limited supplies with her while we waited for help to arrive. It felt like ages before we heard the distant thrum of a helicopter. Soon, a rescue team swooped in, securing her for transport and flying her off to the nearest hospital. Later, we learned the harrowing details of her story. The previous night, she had been hiking with a friend when they both plummeted from the waterfall. Her friend, attempting to seek help, unfortunately succumbed to his injuries less than 100 yards from where we discovered the young woman. No one knew of their accident, her injuries, or even their presence in that part of the trail. The thought of what she endured during those twenty agonizing hours alone in the wilderness still sends chills down my spine. It was nothing short of a miracle that she survived. Our decision to veer off the main trail that day, it turned out to be a life-saving one. I encountered an unknown intelligent humanoid. I pulled into my driveway in Fernandina Beach, Florida, around 9 p.m. on the evening of September 6, 2022. It was very dark out, with no cars or streetlights nearby. I stopped my car and turned it off. I then opened my door and stood up to exit the vehicle. As I stood up, I saw something difficult to describe. With the car door still open, I saw what looked like some kind of cloaked creature walking around the corner of the house from the backyard. It was hard to see. It looked like the shadow of a human-sized creature. It was totally black and moved like a person walking upright. 
It blocked out what was behind it, and I could really only see the distortion it caused. The distortion had wavy edges as if it was surrounded by energy. I could make out its head and shoulders, but only in vague form. The humanoid took several steps, and at that instant I thought to myself, What is that? It stopped dead in its tracks and appeared to look right at me. At this time, I was scared to death that this creature had noticed me and was looking right at me. After a few seconds of looking at each other, the creature turned and walked back around behind the house, and I never saw it again. The entire encounter lasted about 20 seconds. I thought for months it was a ghost or demon, as my grandmother often told stories of seeing ghosts. Only recently have I begun to think it was an intelligent creature with a technology that was inexplicable. After the encounter, I got back into my car and drove to my roommate's work and waited for him to get off work and come home with me. This was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. This is the second unknown encounter I've had. For years, I believed that encounters like these were just reported by crazy people. I now believe that we are clearly not alone and not the smartest or most technologically advanced creatures on this planet and beyond. I have seen where you write and report about various humanoids and other unexplained beings. What are your thoughts? I reported this encounter to Mufon. But I was ignored. Thanks for your time. My buddy and I were on our way to Peoria, which is about an hour and a half away. No one is around. It's one of those real clear nights. Warm summer night. Happened in June. Anyway, we're going along. Nobody around us. Around 11.45 at night, if I remember right. We're driving. Going about 55 miles per hour. We're in the right-hand lane. In the left-hand lane appears out of its own mist. A green figure about seven feet tall. You know what it had on. A cape with no face. Can't tell if it's fat or skinny. And it's standing still in the left-hand lane, and it doesn't budge. With its arms draped out side to side, it was the Grim Reaper. It was the only thing I could think of. I used to laugh at people who would tell me about the Grim Reaper. Right when I was thinking, that was the Grim Reaper and kept it to myself. My buddy says, what was that? And I thought Grim Reaper in my mind, and he said it out loud. And I looked at him with a straight face, and I said, yeah, it was. That was the summertime in June, and I'll never forget it like it happened yesterday. That thing was at least seven feet tall. Never saw it again. Never want to see it again. But it was as real as you and I talking right now. So, on watch one night, me and my buddy were joking around. We were given strict orders not to go beyond the ECP for any reason. Seems fair. Well, about 20 minutes into the watch, we both start shivering, despite it being a warm and humid night. Maybe another 15 minutes and we hear a bud-curdling scream from the woods about 10 yards from the post. I'm talking, it sounded like a woman was being stabbed. Over and over again. It was at least 10 seconds of straight screaming. When morning came around, we asked, and we were told no one was out, and no one was supposed to be in the area except for our guys. I'll tell you a story that has left me both perplexed and fascinated. It involves a young preteen boy named John, who hailed from a local farming family. One fateful day, while he was out in the fields, John vanished without a trace. The entire village rallied together in a frantic search, desperately hoping to find any clue as to his whereabouts. However, despite their efforts, John remained elusive, and his family endured the unbearable agony of his absence. Then, in a twist of fate that seemed almost miraculous, four years after his disappearance, John inexplicably reappeared at the farmhouse. Strangely, he appeared virtually unchanged, as if only a single day had passed since his vanishing. Understandably, John found it immensely difficult to comprehend the passage of time that his parents insisted had transpired during his absence. 
As he recounted his extraordinary tale, it became clear that his experiences during those lost years were far from ordinary. According to John, he had been accosted by a group of peculiar little men while he was in the field. Their actions rendered him completely senseless, and when he regained consciousness, he found himself in a mysterious land, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Frustratingly, he could not provide a coherent explanation of this new realm, but he insisted that the enigmatic little men possessed the ability to show him glimpses of his family's lives. During his time in captivity, John was able to describe in vivid detail certain events that had taken place in his family's absence. He spoke of their visits to Ramsey Corn Market and other activities that he had witnessed from this perplexing land. However, despite his desperate attempts to communicate with his family, all his efforts were in vain. He existed as a mere observer, unable to directly interact with his loved ones, despite his ghost-like endeavors to reach out to them. To John's dismay, he lost all sense of time during his sojourn in that mysterious realm. Days, months, and years merged into a bewildering blur leaving him disoriented and disconnected from the flow of time that governed his family's life. Then one day he awakened in a peculiar spot, far removed from the company of the little men who had held him captive. Sensing their absence, he seized the opportunity to make his way home, gradually regaining his senses as he journeyed back to the farmhouse. Although still groggy from his ordeal, John's relief upon finding his family again was immeasurable. To this day, John remains unable to provide a satisfactory explanation for the inexplicable events he experienced. The enigma surrounding his disappearance and subsequent return has left both him and those who hear his story astounded and bewildered. The tale of John's bewildering odyssey serves as a reminder of the unfathomable mysteries that exist beyond the confines of our everyday reality, forever challenging our understanding of the world around us. My friends and I were around 13, 14 years old. An old abandoned house was on a dirt road about two, three kilometers from where we grew up. We checked out the house and realized it was packed with marijuana plants and what looked like a sophisticated operation. We ran away, but two of my friends went back wanting to steal the marijuana. I knew this was occurring, but chose to stay home. When they were inside, the owner or operator came into the house with a rifle. My friends hid in the closet. He passed directly by the closet with a rifle. He spent about ten minutes looking around the house, and then he left. They then departed the house and ran home through the woods. They did think they might have been shot that day, and they never did see his face. For me personally, if you're out in the woods or in an abandoned facility, and you see in drug operation, run! I found myself lounging near the tranquil shores of Phaleron, a place known for its romantic allure. Lost in contemplation, I stood upon the rugged rocks, my gaze fixated on the vast expanse of the sea. It was in this moment that a peculiar sight caught my attention. Glancing to my right, I spotted two young men perched upon the rocks, not far from where I stood. They possessed an imposing stature, towering above the average man. Curiosity peaked. I directed my gaze towards them, only to discover that they were observing the stars through a large square object of extraordinary brightness. Its radiance was nearly blinding, and as I observed it with astonishment, a breathtaking spectacle unfolded before my eyes. Mars, the red planet, materialized before me in vivid detail, as if a grand performance were unfolding on a theater stage. The two strangers engaged in intricate finger movements and seemed to communicate with the inhabitants of Mars. Astonishingly, the people of this distant world responded in a language unfamiliar to my ears. I beheld women and girls of ethereal beauty, tall and graceful, their captivating forms etching themselves into the depths of my memory. Birds of vibrant plumage flitted about, alighting upon the shoulders of these celestial maidens. 
I bore witness to a multitude of mesmerizing sights and heard melodies of unparalleled loveliness. After some time, the two strangers averted their gaze from the planet, and in the blink of an eye, Mars resumed its place in the firmament, just as it had always been. Overwhelmed by the encounter, I approached the enigmatic duo. As they caught sight of me, they shifted their positions and politely asked if I could spare a light. I offered them matches and cigars, which they graciously accepted. In return, they bestowed upon me a single cigar, claiming to have acquired it in Cuba the day before. To my bewilderment, I informed them that Cuba lay over 4,000 miles away. Undeterred, the two men calmly stated that they hailed from the planet Mars. Intrigued, I listened intently as they proceeded to unveil an extraordinary narrative of civilizations thriving on the distant planet. They spoke of ancient conflicts between various Martian factions, describing their adversaries as the Pelagians. Eventually, the Pelasgians were vanquished and the survivors fled in airships, eventually landing in the northwestern region of Greece, which we now know as Albania. These refugees, it seemed, were the original settlers of Greece. Furthermore, the Martians revealed that Earth civilization in the year 1905 lagged behind Mars by a staggering 100,000 years. They claimed that war had not plagued Mars for over 200,000 years, and astonishingly, they had unraveled the secret of immortality. According to these extraordinary beings, electricity held the key to eternal life. Each morning, the Martians would supposedly nourish themselves with electricity as a potent antidote against death. To my astonishment, they even proclaimed that the revered philosophers, Socrates and Demosthenes, were not mere figures of history, but currently lived on Mars, flourishing in their immortal existence. Soon the shrill sound of a whistle pierced the air, emanating from one of the Martians who introduced himself as Telemachus, while his companion went by the name Phidias. In response to the signal, two robust men emerged from a nearby boat, leaping fearlessly into the waters that plunged to depths of no less than sixty feet. Strapped to their feet were elongated skates fashioned from glistening yellow metal, affixed with sturdy wires. This remarkable contraption enabled the Martians to glide safely across the water's surface. Captivated by this mesmerizing display, I found myself ushered aboard a magnificent floating airship. Within its opulent confines, we dined together, and it was there that I learned of their primary objective on Earth, to meet the renowned inventor Edison in relation to a recent invention that could potentially prove fatal for humanity. Eventually, the time came for me to bid farewell to my extraordinary Martian companions. They escorted me back to the shore, where we parted ways, our encounter etched deeply into the fabric of my memory. It was about 8 p.m., and I was driving home after dropping a friend off at her house. I came to an intersection, a red light, and stopped. Nothing out of the normal, just a regular night. The roads were fairly deserted. While waiting for the light to change, I saw something that looked like the back end of a deer as it quickly crossed the street. I didn't think much of it except for the fact that when I drive through there, I have to be careful because deer apparently like to jump in front of cars. That stretch of road is only a couple hundred feet posted at 40 miles per hour. I slowed to about 30-35 miles per hour to watch and look at the deer. When I looked to see if the deer was still there, I witnessed something quite a bit different. This massive thing was standing back a ways, but it was clearly visible. The yard it was standing in has a huge white shed with a light attached to the front, though. This didn't help because it cast a big shadow. The figure stood on the ground, but its height reached to about the top of the doors to the shed. It had two curved like masses coming from the sides, but the most obvious feature were the deep red glowing eyes coming from the center of the black mass. It was something I couldn't stop looking at. I continued to drive, but all the way home I felt I was being followed. I'd like to share an experience my friend and I have unfortunately been dragged into. 
At approximately 10.30 p.m. tonight, I received an instant message from my friend about a rather disturbing encounter she had. She had reported she saw the Mothman. I sent her several messages back asking if she was all right, if she was there, etc. She eventually sent me a text message with a picture that she drew of the creature attached. By this point, I was literally getting sick and trembling due to anxiety and fright. We began talking about it, and I noticed a tapping at my window, a very light kind of sound. My dogs both jerked their heads upward and stared at the window for a long time. Being in the state I was in, I refused to look. For a while, the tapping stopped. She and I continued to discuss the matter at hand. Suddenly, the tapping began again, but this time the dogs ignored it, and so did I. About four or five minutes later, I fought the urge to stare at my computer monitor and looked at my window. My blinds were closed, but I could faintly see something red and glowing, like daylights that had somehow made their way into the neighbor's backyard. I quickly looked away, not wanting to see it anymore. I looked again a couple minutes later, unnerved to see the red glow was still there. Again, I looked away and continued discussing this with my friend. Finally, I turned my head one final time and saw that the glow no longer remained. As I'm typing this email, I'm really worried, as the tapping has begun again and I'm really too afraid to move from this position. Above this, I've included my friend's side of the story, and should you post this, we would certainly appreciate if you could put them both into one piece. We discussed calling the police, but she didn't want to make a big deal about it. Her parents brushed it off, and I have yet to tell anyone in my house about this. I'm not sure what this was, a frightening delusion or a real situation, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to face the facts and find out. Thanks for your time. Well, both my friend and I live closer to Middletown, Ohio. There was another encounter I had shortly after. I had sent the email, and I kept forgetting that I had sent it. I had walked out of my room to wash my face, try and calm myself down, etc. And my brother's room is directly across the hall from mine. I looked straight ahead, and it was looking right through the window of his room. That's the picture I had sent. I stared at it for a while, feeling kind of cold, and then feeling really scared, and I finally pulled my eyes away and went about my business. When I came out of my bathroom, I didn't look in the direction of his room. My friend reported that what she saw had more oblique-shaped eyes and looked kind of angry. I wasn't too sure about that hypothesis. While mine had large, round eyes and seemed kind of curious or something, Sorry I didn't include that in the original message. Like I said, this happened after I sent the email, and I keep assuming had included it when I hadn't. Other than the weird sightings, there wasn't any strange activity I can recall. In the heart of a vast and untouched forest, a group of three young hikers embarked on an adventurous journey. Their backpacks weighed them down, but their spirits were high with anticipation. Each hiker possessed a unique personality that set them apart. There was Mark, the outgoing and fearless leader of the group. His rugged appearance matched his adventurous nature, and he wore a determined look on his face as he navigated through the dense foliage. By his side was Sarah, a nature enthusiast with a gentle spirit. Her bright eyes sparkled with curiosity as she soaked in the beauty of the surroundings. Finally, there was Alex, the mischievous and carefree joker of the group. Always up for a thrill, he added a light-hearted touch to their excursions. As they trekked deeper into the forest, fate led them to an unexpected discovery. A long-forgotten Cherokee Native American burial ground. The air hung heavy with a sense of sacredness, and whispers of warning seemed to echo through the trees. Local tribesmen, led by an elder known as Sitting Owl, had long guarded this resting place, cautioning outsiders to show respect and avoid disturbing the spirits that dwelled there. Ignorant of the sacredness and disregardful of the warnings, the hikers succumbed to the lure of mischief. 
In their inebriated state, they thoughtlessly disrupted the tranquility of the burial ground, defiling it with their disrespectful actions. Night fell, casting an eerie veil over the forest. The hikers, seeking refuge from the darkness, stumbled upon an abandoned Native American cabin hidden amidst the trees. Unbeknownst to them, the cabin had its own dark history, intertwined with the curse of the disturbed burial ground. As the moonlight filtered through the cracks in the cabin's wooden walls, the atmosphere grew increasingly sinister. Unseen forces stirred, awakened by the desecration of the sacred ground. The hiker's presence had unleashed an ancient curse that sought to exact its vengeance upon those who trespassed. One by one, the hikers began to succumb to strange and inexplicable afflictions. Mark, the fearless leader, was struck by a sudden and debilitating stroke that left him paralyzed and helpless. Sarah, the nature enthusiast, convulsed violently, vomiting a black viscous substance before succumbing to a suffocating darkness. Alex, the carefree joker, inexplicably lost his sight, stumbling blindly and meeting a tragic end when he fell upon the sharp blades of a long-forgotten garden rake. The next morning, Sitting Owl, with a mix of sorrow and anger, arrived at the scene. His eyes surveyed the tragic aftermath, and he exhaled a heavy sigh. Strangers should stay away from our burial grounds. He uttered a stern warning laced with sadness. The price of their disrespect had been paid in blood, and the spirits of the ancient Cherokee ancestors had taken their vengeance. In my twenties, my dumbass went camping near Hagerman, Idaho, at a little gravel beach spot right off the Snake River. It was myself, my fiancé, and his best friend. They stayed up a little too late Friday night, and I woke up a little too early Saturday morning. Bored, I hiked up through some large boulders on the side of a rocky cliff that was about 300 feet so I could watch the sunrise. It was a cool July morning. Fifties, so I didn't bring more than a small bottle of water, not realizing the desert heats up way faster than you'd ever imagine once that sun hits the horizon. Within forty minutes of the sun coming up, I decide that it's hitting seventy-plus degrees already and time to head back. Going down was going to be more precarious because there wasn't exactly a trail. Also with the heat came the rattlesnakes, hundreds of them, not just one or two, but literally slithering out and curling up goddamned everywhere in the crevices between the rocks. I didn't have a stick or way to gently coerce them to move, so I had no option but to get onto the boulders and do my best to hop from rock to rock without killing myself or provoking them. I've never seen or expected so many snakes in one area, but with so little water, no sun cream on, and the mid-July desert waiting to dehydrate me to oblivion. Stopping was not an option. My campmates were sleeping off a boozy night and wouldn't hear me call for help, even if I'd tried. I've never been bothered by snakes in the past, but the scene in Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark came swimming to mind with a brand new appreciation. It took me about 90 minutes to get up the cliff and about four hours of precarious leaps to get back down. I finally hit safety around 9.30 a.m. and vowed at that point to never do stupid shit like that again. Mother Nature is metal, and she'll remind you she's the boss every single time. Okay, so in 2006, when I first started working at Walmart at 20, I used to walk several miles home every day down a long highway. Every now and then, I used to get picked up by people who were very nice and saw I was suffering out in the heat in the middle of summer with my shirt off and just a wife beater on. Well, one day a guy picks me up and seems cool at first, but then he started telling me how he is a modeling agent and was looking for talent. He asked if that was something I was interested in, and I wasn't sure, but was wondering where this was going. He started asking me if I have body hair on my body, which I answered, until he started asking if I had any hair on my ass and other private places. 
At this point, the danger alarms were ringing in my head, and I just wanted to get out of that car extremely fast. I asked him to drop me off at some random neighborhood that was about twenty minutes from where I live, and I just walked into the staircase and waited about fifteen miles to make sure he wasn't around and couldn't follow me home. And then I walked home, looking over my shoulder the whole way. To this day, it freaks me out, the vibes the guy gave me. I felt that if I didn't get out of that car, I, I was never going to make it home. And I just realized I misread the op, and it's about hiking, not hitchhiking, lol. One, 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 one. Went hiking at this shitty state park in East Texas. First of all, you drive down this long dirt road past a cemetery where they're having funerals. Then when you finally find the unmarked parking lot, you can see the buzzards all over. Walk down to the lake and the smell of rotting dead animal is overpowering. Buzzards everywhere. Bones everywhere. Finally, you can hear the ranch nearby upstream shooting. And I put it all together. These assholes were shooting varmints and throwing them in the part of the river or creek that would wash them into the lake. The carcasses would eventually wash on shore and rot or be eaten by buzzards. Buzzard shit, rotting meat, and bones everywhere. Not really a hiker, but I live in the woods, and occasionally you see weird shit. You'd be shocked at how often bucks will try to jump or run through a tree at full gallop, with two shoots from one root, think of up, shape and instantly break their neck or get stuck with their horns past the tree but can't squeeze out. They either die immediately and are propped up by the tree or slowly starve in that position. The bottom line is, it's not exactly rare to stumble across what looks like a rotting deer standing between two trees, especially along paths, uh, game trails where predators will chase them. Another fun, creepy thing with deer that's probably related to the above, is chronic wasting disease, mad cow, or UCJD for deer. I swear it literally turns deer into walking zombies with giant wounds showing internal organs, rotting necrotic tissue, growths hanging off them, milky eyes, etc. In other words, the full animal zombie experience. It's incredibly infectious without predators to cull them, so it's affecting whole herds of deer. If you decide to Google it, do it on an empty stomach. Seriously, it's that nasty. I've heard stories and seen videos of bucks literally bashing their heads to pulp on rocks until they're dead. It rots their brain and weakens them so much they just kind of go on autopilot and do all kinds of context-inappropriate deer things. I was camping in Rock Quarry the night before we were going to rock climb. The kids were shooting a bottle rockets in the quarry for about an hour. Then we were all standing around fire, just talking, when all of a sudden this loud scream came from the top northwest side of the quarry. At fist we just stood there looking at each other, kind of wondering what in the world, what just screamed. I asked John, my friend, who has been an avid outdoorsman his whole life, if he had ever heard something like that before, and he said he didn't know what it could be. Then there was another scream, but it was more intense, and it seemed closer this time. At this point, my oldest son went and locked himself in my pickup truck. The screaming went on for a good ten minutes at least. We were just standing there by the fire, amazed at what we were hearing. I had been videoing the boys with my camcorder, and I didn't even think to turn it on at all. I wish I would have now. The screaming finally ended, and we didn't know what it was and just kind of talked for a while longer and went to bed. Later on, I awoke to hear some far-off screams, and then they ended, and I fell back asleep. We really never talked much about it after that, until one night I was listening to some of the Bigfoot sounds on your page, and when a certain sound came up, the hair on my neck stood up. It was the exact same sound we heard that night in the rock quarry.
To verify that I was hearing what I was hearing, I went and woke my son up and told him to come listen to this sound on the computer. I also told him not to look at the computer, but just listen to see if he recognized the sound. I clicked on the sound, and my son, after listening, immediately said, That's what we heard when we went camping at Rattlesnake, and that pretty much confirmed it for me. My opinion is it was Bigfoot. I have hunted and been in the woods my whole life, and have never heard something like that before, or probably will again. I regret not taping the sound, but who was to know? But I definitely believe. This lasted three nights in a row. The first night we were awakened by a very powerful scream. The only way I can describe it was it was like the sound of tires on the road coming to a screeching halt. Just like all the other Bigfoot stories, it was unlike anything I've ever heard, and I know it wasn't a bear, cougar, elk, etc. It was very loud and lengthy, and what caught my attention was it wasn't moving through the woods as a normal North American animal would. It was staying in one spot. It sounded to me like it was breaking tree limbs and rolling logs down a hill. This lasted about ten minutes or so, then it went away. This happened for the next two nights about the same time. But on days two and three, it kept moving farther and farther away. Needless to say, I was terrified, but also interested and curious. I was too scared to get out of my tent, so I just lied there and listened and hoped it wouldn't bother us. I was camping with my family at Timothy Lake. Late one night, we were awakened by people at nearby camps, yelling, saying that there was a bear or something outside. We then heard something running pretty fast. I can remember feeling the ground shake when its feet hit the ground. It ran not too far from our tent into the woods, and it sounded like it might have ran into a tree because we heard a loud bang and the sound of a tree cracking and falling. We aren't sure what it was, though. While sitting in the blazer, with three other females ranging in age from 1334, all of which were sleeping, that was broken down, waiting for help to return. I noticed on the east side that there seemed to be something peeking out from a tree, approximately twenty into the woods. I was thinking that it could have been a trick of lighting, and the wind moving some branches is the only time I seemed to be seeing movement was when I was looking straight ahead to the north the direction the blazer was headed, and this was out of the corner of my right eye to the east, and every time I would move my head to the right, it would stop. I played this game for a while, but decided that if I was really seeing something, that I was going to have to turn my head to the right. I dozed off for a while, and when I woke, I was still looking off to the right, east, and there was something peeking around a tree that was closer, more like fifteen feet or so, so I just kept my eyes on the object and was able to make out that it was tall, hairy, light coloring in the face except for the eye and mouth area. It didn't move, but just like a shifting of feet once in a while. It didn't advance any more, but seemed intent on watching what was going on or in seeing just what it was that it was looking at. I couldn't smell anything as the wind was blowing to the east. I didn't awake anyone because I didn't want to scare them. I didn't feel threatened. But I wasn't going to go and check it out either. At 3.30, help arrived, and so I concentrated on what needed to be done to get the broken-down rig off the hill. Also noticed, the footsteps that were heard were further down the hill, closer to the second split in the logging road. I don't have any more detail other than what I already said about that part. Other witnesses, there were four of us up on the hill. I was waiting for my husband to come back with help. The other three were sleeping. I didn't mention this to anyone till later in the day. The 17-year-old said that she had heard walking around the truck and that she knew the difference between two and four feet stepping around and that it was something on two feet. She didn't see anything, though.
In June of 1970, I was riding my motorcycle to Janolan Caves. Around 10 a.m., the sky darkened, and I decided to continue to the Canangra Walls. As I drove along the gum-lined road near Aberon, a silvery glow suddenly overcame me, lighting up the road ahead. Unable to stop, I drove straight into the glow. The recently darkened sky allowed the bright glow to illuminate the surrounding forest, seemingly originating from above. As I entered the glow, I was lifted quickly towards a large circular object. Once inside, the floor closed beneath me, leaving me standing in a glowing light blue room. The room was hexagonal and flat, about fifty feet across and twelve feet high. I was terrified, but a voice in my head reassured me, and I began to relax. A wall section slid open, and three alien-looking beings, about six feet tall, with grayish-blue skin, approached me. They had teeth, noses, and sex organs similar to humans, but their eyes were like a doe's. The beings led me into another room with strange equipment and a large metallic oblong block which had a body-shaped groove in it. After examining me, they asked me to lie in the groove where I felt magnetized and glued to the metal. Eventually, I passed out. When I regained consciousness, I was surrounded by multiple blue beings. Two of them held my clothes, shoes, and belongings. I dressed myself as they watched, and they led me through a brightly lit passageway to a large tube-shaped walkway which led to a colossal building. Inside, I saw countless male and female beings communicating telepathically. I was led to a green dome-shaped building where I would temporarily reside. It had odd furniture, a rubbery bed, and a toilet made of crystal-like metal. The two beings showed me various fruits and vegetables to eat and drink in plastic jars and bottles. During my stay, I was flown in an oval-shaped hovercraft vehicle along a metallic road to a vast museum-like building, and later to a different world with narrow waterways and forests of tall trees. I saw a large ocean with drinkable water and various watercraft. My captors informed me that I'd been taken for study and that they had studied my memory and brain. Before I lost consciousness, I was told that the inhabitants of this planet were called Ultra, beings at the peak of evolution. And when I woke up, I would possess higher knowledge. When I came to, I was lying on the road beside my motorcycle, half an hour before my abduction. Confused, I got up, started my motorcycle, and went home. My family didn't believe my story, and eventually, after suffering a breakdown due to my experience, I left the country with them. My friends and I were inseparable. Our favorite pastime was playing manhunt in the dense forest near our neighborhood. The thrill of chasing each other through the woods and the adrenaline rush of trying not to be caught kept us entertained for hours on end. One summer evening, we had split up into teams, and the game was in full swing. The forest had always felt eerie, and the sense of being watched was ever-present. But we were young and fearless, and the excitement of the game outweighed any lingering uneasiness. As darkness fell, we started to lose track of each other. My friend, let's call him Mike, had wandered deeper into the forest, drawn by what he believed were our voices calling out to him. The calls grew louder and more insistent, luring him further into the dense woods. Mike eventually stumbled upon an unsettling scene. Small figures made of sticks were hanging from the trees all around him, like eerie effigies, swaying gently in the breeze. In the middle of the forest, he found a church that seemed to appear out of nowhere, its presence entirely out of place. The calls he had been following abruptly stopped, leaving him with a chilling silence. What Mike didn't know was that we had left the forest long before, concerned for his safety and unable to locate him. The voices he had heard were not ours, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister had been trying to lure him deeper into the woods. Terrified, Mike raced back towards the edge of the forest, desperate to escape the haunting scene he had just witnessed. When he finally emerged, breathless and shaken, we were waiting for him. As he recounted his experience, 
we couldn't help but feel a shiver run down our spines. To this day, we don't know how much of Mike's story was true, or whether his imagination had gotten the better of him. But one thing was certain. The forest had always been a place where we felt uneasy. We had come across broken bottles, mysterious teepees, and signs of demonic activity, likely the work of mischievous teenagers with a can of spray paint. But after that night, we couldn't shake the feeling that something darker lurked within those woods. We never played manhunt in the forest again, and the memories of our carefree teenage years were forever tinged with the eerie echoes of that one fateful night. When I was around ten, I was walking along a track near the ocean with my parents. I ran ahead and heard a commotion in the tree above me. I looked up in time to see a possum's carcass drop at my feet. Its head was gone. I had spooked an eagle. I immediately looked back at my dad, thinking it was some practical joke he's pulled. When we were walking back, we saw a couple and warned them to watch out for flying headless possums. They must have thought we were crazy. My day started like any other summer day, only this time I had the whole day to myself. It was August 7th, and I had decided to spend it in the beautiful town of Valsets, Oregon, specifically on the south fork of the Silitz River. I was just a mile west of the town, an area now closed due to fire danger. My plan was to enjoy a peaceful day panning for gold, something I found to be incredibly calming and rewarding over the years. The morning was beautiful, with a cool breeze and the sun's rays piercing through the tall trees. After a while, I got lost in the peaceful rhythm of panning. Suddenly, a smell hit me. It was peculiar and strong, something I hadn't experienced before. It was a mixture of wet dog and something else I couldn't put my finger on. Lifting my gaze from the shimmering water, I, I saw it. Through the rim of my glasses, I could see a figure standing tall and motionless. I squinted, adjusting my glasses for a clearer view, and there it was, a creature that could only be described as a Bigfoot, staring right at me. It was about eight feet tall, covered in dark fur, its eyes holding an intelligent yet wild gaze. My heart pounded in my chest as a wave of fear washed over me. However, instead of screaming or running, I decided to talk softly to the creature trying to show it. I meant no harm. To my surprise, it tilted its head slightly, as if listening, then turned around and walked away into the forest. Still shaken, I packed my gear and headed for my car, my day of peaceful panning now transformed into a day I'd never forget. As I drove off, I glanced at the trees, and there it was, another one silently standing and watching from the forest's edge. Now, I know there will be skeptics reading this. It's not every day someone claims to have seen a Bigfoot, let alone two in one day. But I stand by what I saw, and as incredible as it may sound, it wasn't the first time. Over the years, I've been fortunate, or maybe just plain lucky, to uh, had about 40 or 50 encounters with these elusive creatures. My experiences have made me believe that there's a lot more to this world than we think we know. I was backpacking with my boyfriend in the mountains in Colorado. The area was fairly popular, a big parking lot, with a few trails that split off into different directions. We had passed through a big valley and were making our way up through steep woods with lots of switchbacks. We were carrying good-sized packs and planned to camp in an alpine meadow above. It was summer, good weather, good times. I have a few guns, and I brought one that I hadn't hiked with before. A Smith & Wesson 4-inch 686. It was heavy. We took turns carrying it in the holster and in hand, not on my hip like I do with my smaller and lighter 3-inch Smith. I'd started with it on my hip, but it was too big, awkward, heavy. My boyfriend is carrying the gun as we turn past another switchback. We see a guy coming down the trail towards us. A few unusual things immediately caught our attention. One... 
He didn't have a backpack or water or any gear at all. We were a few miles in, so someone should at least have water, too. He was wearing surgical-type gloves, for real, not regular outdoor gloves. Not some newfangled hipster outdoor gloves from REA. Actual surgical gloves in the middle of the forest. Three. He had an extremely creepy expression. Eyes too big and wide. Icky too big smile. My boyfriend and I exchanged a few quick words before he reached us, getting mentally prepared. My boyfriend had the gun if we needed it, and we stepped off the trail slightly so he wouldn't pass too close. He just smiled his creepy smile and went past. Because my boyfriend was carrying that heavy gun in his hand, still holstered, that dude knew we had a gun. It obviously wasn't pointed at the guy, but he knew. As we went on, my boyfriend and I kept stopping and checking to be sure he wasn't coming back behind us. Not far past this we saw a bit of blue tarp poking out from behind a large rock. We both thought it could be a body or something, so my boyfriend checked and wasn't happy to have that job. Just a tarp, crumpled but in good shape, seemed to have been put there recently. Not sure why it would be way up there, though. We eventually reached the Alpine Lake and camped. Nothing bad happened. There was another couple somewhat nearby on one side of the lake, which made me feel better. Normally, I'd rather be alone after backpacking in. But they were closer to the trail, so if the crazy dude came back, maybe he'd go after them first and we would hear something. I know that's really horrible to think say that, but they were a buffer. Anyway, nothing bad happened. But we never forgot that dude. I am so glad I wasn't alone. Thank you, boyfriend. Why no gear or water, but surgical gloves and a lunatic expression a few miles in on a mountain trail. I had a pretty close encounter in September 1994, I believe, near Tallgate, Oregon, during elk bow season. I had been in the woods for several days. I was tracking a hit elk on the north side of USFS Road 64, skyline about opposite Jubilee Lake at about 1 or 2 p.m. I was down the Skookum Spring side of Dusty Ridge, about one quarter to half mile from Dusty Spring, an abandoned campground and saw movement about seventy yards cross lope and down at the edge of a clearing, some thirty or forty yards across a large biped with unusually long seeming arms walked across the clearing heading away and up slope at an unhurried pace. Near the far edge of the clearing it stopped and turned, looking directly at me. It was covered head to foot in hair, dark brownish in color, and I got a very too good, actually, look at it. It knew I was there, I have no doubt to this day. It then turned and continued away. I saw it for perhaps two minutes in bright sunlight. I vacated the area without finding my elk or going over to look for tracks. I can say it was not a man or anything I have seen before. As it walked, it swung its arms, but they were so that the palms of the hand was clearly to the rear, and much nearer the knees as opposed to the hip as mine are. The date time can be better established because when I got home and was telling my wife, she said that the previous weekend some guy had taken videos of Bigfoot at Hoodoo Springs, some twenty miles from where I was at, and they had been on the news. I have no pictures, but can certainly take someone to the spot without difficulty even now. I was eighteen and was going to a friend, say, Mike, house with another friend of mine. Let's call him Joe, on my bike, motorcycle, to be clear. So we reached this friend's house, which was in first floor. We tried calling him out from the street. His moms came out and said he wasn't home. We started again from there to another spot, where we and a couple of other friends hang out. Just after we start, Joe tells me to go the same spot that I had in mind, and I tell him I had the same thoughts, too. Now we reach the spot, and almost all of our friends are there, as expected. I had a tiny little chat, which barely lasted a minute, and then noticed that Joe wasn't behind me. 
I concluded myself that he was playing me and asked the guys where he was hiding. They had no idea what I was talking about. I thought of pranking them all back and decided to leave the place so that Joe would have to walk back home. A couple of hundred meters later, Joe walks towards me from a completely different direction. I was completely blank, cuz. I'm the only one with a motorcycle, and nobody else could drop him there from the spot. I asked him how he got there. Joe, I got down at the Mike's home. When you started, I was screaming for you to stop, but you just kept going. I was like, who was I talking to then, on the way to the spot? The solitude that comes with living in a national park can be both intoxicating and haunting. I spent three months as the sole human inhabitant in one, a seemingly endless expanse of nature that was both my home and my sanctuary. The experience was mostly peaceful, the silence broken only by the sounds of the wind, the trees, and the occasional wildlife. But there was something else that often punctuated the quiet music. It was a melody as soft and tinkling as a music box, or perhaps a distant ice cream truck on a hot summer day. The peculiar thing was, it always seemed to echo from somewhere above me, a melody floating on the breeze, an auditory illusion that was both fascinating and slightly unsettling. One day, driven by curiosity, I decided to track the source of the enigmatic music. I followed the dirt road that wound past my humble trailer, guided only by the elusive ethereal melody that continued to waft through the trees. But as I ventured further, it was difficult to gauge if I was getting closer or if the source was just as elusive as before. My eyes were fixed on the treetops, straining to locate the origin of the strange sounds when my gaze was drawn downward. A snake lay stretched out in the path ahead. I stumbled backward in surprise, but the creature made no move. It took me a moment to understand why. The snake was dead. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked around and saw that the snake wasn't alone. Half a dozen dead copperheads lay strewn across the road, their lifeless bodies all aligned in the same direction. It was as if they had been journeying somewhere, only to be simultaneously struck down. Fear snaked its way up my spine, replacing my curiosity with a primal instinct to retreat. I couldn't bring myself to step over the ominous assembly of deceived serpents. Turning around, I rushed back to my trailer, intent on using my car to navigate past the eerie spectacle. But as I fumbled for my keys, the music abruptly ceased. The ensuing silence was almost deafening, filling the space the melody had previously occupied. The sudden stop seemed to echo the strange, unsettling event I had just witnessed. Despite my numerous walks afterward, the music never returned. The only reminders of that day were the silent woods and the memory of the bizarre serpentine gathering on the road. The experience became another secret shared between the park and me, an enigma that underscored the underlying mystery and magic of nature. This started as early as my childhood. I reckon I'm what my religion or community describes as special. I have the ability to see the paranormal. However, I'm taught to be as logical and scientific as possible since young. I often try to explain my special encounters as reflection of light. My eyes are blurry, bad lightnings. So let me tell you a bit more about my vision since young. Often then, not I see black mist figures, and I can't exactly see their facial expression. Just a vague human-like body covered with either black or white cloth, and they merely appear for a blink of an eye. However, this one incident had me convinced that truly whatever I have seen or encountered was not just my imagination. In my Asian community, we tend to stay at our parents till we are married or whenever we are financially stable of affording one. Houses in the Asian community are not cheap at all. So being a college undergraduate after working on my thesis till 3 a.m., I decided to call it a night 
switch on my night lights and get ready for my night reading, halfway through a white figure with a distorted face and lenny hair came floating into my room. I definitely had my window closed since I lived in an air-conditioned room. It was staring at me as it make its way to the side of my bed slowly, gently and silently. Fear intertwined my every cells, my body unable to obey my command. Her bloodshot eyes locked with mine, and abruptly she let out an eerie shriek for a minute or two, and disappear into thin air. My parents, upon hearing the shriek, came rushing in as I burst into tears. Till this date, we have no explanation whom it was or what's its purpose. When I was a police officer, I had the ability to bond with folks with mental health issues. They would calm down and the situation would defuse itself. There was one older woman. She had an apartment but would wander the streets at all hours. She would scream at passing cars, go into businesses, and, and start asking for money and steal people's food, etc. She also shoplifted a lot. Needless to say, she got arrested a lot. When she would be arrested, she would fight like a wildcat, injuring herself and the officers arresting her, except for me. I would say, Annie, you're gonna have to go with me now, and she would. The first time I arrested her, I asked if she had eaten, and she said no. So I stopped at KFC and got her a two-piece and a biscuit. Drove real slow to the jail so she could eat. After that, when she got caught stealing, she would request me to take her in. I didn't mind because no one got hurt. Annie didn't bathe real regular so that to freshen up, she would splash herself with Stetson aftershave. The combination of her body odor and the Stetson could really gag you. Fast forward, and I've gotten promoted to sergeant. Right after coming on for afternoon shift, we get a fatal car accident. Annie had walked into the street at rush hour and been run over by a truck. Pretty bad scene, the wheel crushed her head, and I couldn't help but be depressed. Because while she could be a pain, she couldn't help it. It was just sad. When I got promoted, I was issued an unmarked car to replace my marked unit 361. I was out on the road later that evening when dispatch got a call that someone was breaking into one of the cruisers parked behind the station. They said the person was in the back seat sitting. I was close and responded. The citizen pointed out the cruise, and it was my old one, 361. When I got to it, no one was in it. I opened it up and was immediately hit with the overpowering smell of Stetson aftershave. When I was just a kid, roughly 14, I am now 20, my dad and I went archery hunting on state game land a couple miles from our house. There were a lot of tram roads from people mining for coal back in the days. That said, we were a mile from the main road where we had our tree stands. It, my dad's stand was about 100 yards east of mine. Anyway, it was getting dark, so I knew to head out of the stand and meet my dad at the truck. I heard all this crashing and thought one. My dad was meeting my at my stand for once and two. He was making a lot of noise. So I turned my head and boom. I see two little bear cubs play fighting with one another. They couldn't have been a year old. Truly a beautiful sight to see. However, what terrified me the most? Where was Mama Bear? I immediately called my dad, freaking out. He said, well, you're an idiot for staying in the woods this long. Should have been at the truck by now. Just make your way towards me. I'll meet you on the trail. The cubs were far enough out to where I could still see them but there was a good distance between us. With my arrow still notched and my three-pocket knife in my hand, I climbed out of my stand and tried to be as quiet as possible. I met my dad, and we made it home. I have never been more terrified of the woods, except when I run into a spider web hanging face, level in the middle of a trail, heart attack every time. I work in the field of prison corrections where surveillance is a critical part of our operations. 
In the supervisor's control booth, I have a clear view of the inmate housing unit control booths where my deputies closely monitor the activities of the inmates. One particular night, as I glanced at the CCTV monitors, I noticed my deputy sitting in the control booth. Curiosity struck me, and I decided to call him to inquire about the person standing behind him. It was an odd sight, because there shouldn't have been anyone else present, as everyone had responded to an emergency call. To my surprise, he replied that he was alone in the booth. Confused, I continued watching as the figure remained there, while my deputy diligently searched for the mysterious presence. As soon as he settled back in his seat and picked up the telephone, the figure vanished into thin air. Determined to make sense of what I had witnessed, I hurriedly went to review the security footage, hoping to capture evidence of the strange figure. However, as I meticulously examined the recorded footage, there was no trace of the mysterious entity. It was as if it had never appeared on the screen at all. Ever since that incident, Whenever my gaze falls upon that particular camera angle on the monitor, a shiver runs down my spine. The memory of that inexplicable sight lingers, haunting me to this day, even though it happened six years ago. In July 1968, my family and I were living in a small town west end of Montrose County called Buravan, Colorado. In the early morning, I was awakened by the barking of a family dog named Tippy outside my bedroom window. Tippy never really barked unless someone or something was in a yard that wasn't supposed to be. I remember waking up out of dead sleep and hearing Tippy constantly barking and wondering why my older brother, who's sleeping bunk above and my parents sleeping in the bedroom, joining ours, weren't telling Tippy to quit. Finally, I had enough of it and decided to turn over in my bed and look out the window myself. When I did, I couldn't believe what saw. There it was a small circle ship with its landed gear down and hatch with stairs fold down to the ground. Next to the ship were green lizard-like beings. Their eyes were bright yellow and some tanks were on their backs in another bag. They didn't have fingers but had web hands that looked like a bow and arrow. Their body was thin and scaly. Their legs were also thin, and their feet had V-shaped toes. I remember thinking to myself this was some kind of hunting party because my dad was a bow hunter himself, and that kind of gave me the idea. I could tell they were searching for something. Then another alien came off the ship. It was much bigger than the others and seemed to give the others orders. Tippy again began her barking, and the alien close to our house seemed to be upset with her barking. I could see it looking over at Tippy, and it started walking over to her. I then jumped off my bed and headed into my parents' room to wake my mother up. I remember how hard it was to wake her. She acted like she was on a heavy drug or something. I couldn't get her to wake up. Finally was able to get her up and told them something was going on outside and that it was going hurt Tippy. She was still not awake and was sluggish. My mother followed me to my bedroom. Once there, I showed what I was seeing outside. I don't know what they did to my mom, but she couldn't see them. All she wanted to do was sleep. Finally, my mother got up from my bed and told me to crawl to the other side of my bed away from the window. I did what I was told. The last thing remember before going to sleep was looking over in the closet where the window cast light on my clothes and saw two of the lizard beings trying to look in the window. No other sound came from Tippy. My mother wasn't drinking or taking anything that would cause sedation. I firmly believe they did something to the family to make them sleep. It just didn't work on me. In the morning, the first thing I did was to run out and check on Tippy and my PGs. Sure enough, she was lying in the front yard waiting for kids to come to play with her. She acted like nothing had happened the night before. I was twelve years old at the time, and the memory is etched in my conscience. It was not a dream or hallucination. I have included an image of what the lizard people looked like. Interestingly enough, on the same night my mother passed away in 2016, she asked me if I had remembered seeing the lizard people in their ship in our yard in Colorado. That was the only time she acknowledged witnessing the incident.
The Tungas National Forest, located in the rugged wilderness of Alaska, is a place of raw beauty and untamed wilderness. Towering ancient trees reach towards the heavens. Their branches intertwined like a protective canopy against the sky. The forest is teeming with life, from the graceful flight of bald eagles to the elusive footprints left behind by bears and wolves. But beneath its serene facade, there lies a dark undercurrent, a whispered legend of strange creatures lurking deep within the woods. It is in this enigmatic setting that I find myself, Anna, a diligent park ranger with a passion for protecting the natural wonders of the world. Transferred to Tongass National Forest after a heated disagreement with my former boss, I couldn't help but feel a sense of trepidation as I set foot in this new territory. Rumors of bizarre sightings and unexplained phenomena echoed through the park ranger community but I dismissed them as mere tales meant to thrill campfire gathering. As I delved into my duties conducting routine patrols and ensuring the safety of visitors, I gradually became aware of a subtle shift in the forest's atmosphere. Whispering voices carried on the wind, their words elusive and indiscernible. Shadows danced at the periphery of my vision, vanishing as I turned to face them. Strange occurrences became part of my daily routine, a rustle in the undergrowth where no creature should be, an inexplicable chill running down my spine in the dead of summer. With each passing night, the forest revealed more of its chilling secret. It started one evening as I sat alone in my ranger cabin poring over maps and reports. A growl guttural and unnatural reverberated through the walls. Startled, I rose from my chair and rushed outside, my heart pounding in my chest. The night air was thick with anticipation as I scanned the area, but I found no trace of its origin. Just as I turned to retreat, my gaze fell upon a pair of glowing eyes in the distance, a haunting, unearthly luminescence that pierced the darkness. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, tinged with a tinge of fear, I cautiously ventured towards those mesmerizing orbs. The forest seemed to hold its breath as I closed the gap, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. And then there it was, a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen, standing on two legs like a man, yet possessing the snarling visage of a wild beast. It resembled the infamous dogman of folklore. Its hulking figure, covered in matted fur, seemed to blend seamlessly with the shadows. With trembling hands, I steadied my rifle and took aim. The sound of the gunshot reverberated through the forest, accompanied by a growl that sent shivers down my spine. The wounded creature retreated, disappearing into the depths of the woods, but not before casting me a piercing glare that chilled me to the core. As my heart raced with adrenaline, I approached the cave from where the creature had emerged, and there, in the pale glow of my flashlight, I made a horrifying discovery. The cave floor was littered with the remains of hikers, bones, torn clothing, and gear strewn haphazardly. The realization hit me like a physical blow. This creature, this dogman, had been hunting unsuspecting victims within these very woods, feasting upon their lives in a macabre dance of death. Distressed and filled with anxiety, I fumbled for my radio and called for backup. The police arrived, their presence bringing a semblance of comfort amidst the nightmare that had unfolded. I recounted the events, my voice trembling with the weight of what I had witnessed. The remains of nearly twenty hikers painted a grim picture of the forest hidden horrors. As a native Michigander, I remember back in the nineties my stepbrother James, my cousin Lalo, and three other friends of mine and I were up at Houghton Lake during the summer for some fishing, swimming, drinking, and smoking weed. Things that guys do in their twenties. It was fun and great memories, and none of us have ever heard, let alone know about Dogman. Anyways, it was an uneventful day besides the typical fun we all had. Now, as the day was ending and the sun was going down, not quite sunset, but close, 
We all packed into James Ford's tin pickup after we finished cleaning up and packing our bock and fishing equipment. Lilo had another joint left at the time, real good red hair, Sensi. James was like, there's a dirt road that goes around the lake. Do you guys want to drive down it and see where it goes? We all said yes, and we drove out to explore this newly found road. So as we're driving down this dirt road, the foliage was like prehistoric times. With huge ferns as shrubbery, the sun was beginning to set, and the tree canopy was making its surrounding area darker than it is. So James pulls over on the side of the road, turns off the engine, gets out, and starts walking into the woods. Someone asked what he was doing, and James replied, I'm going to explore the area, so we all get out and follow behind him. There's no trail, so James, who's leading, is making a trail. Well, there's an incline, and we're all walking up, and it's getting darker every second. Suddenly, James stops, and my cousin, who's behind James, asks why he stopped. James, from what I was told later, said, Do you hear that? Looking intently into the growing darkness of the woods. Lalo says, Yeah. What is it? I don't know, answered James. Now we all stopped wondering what was going on. Now we didn't go too far into the thick woods, maybe fifty yards up the slope. Suddenly I hear, oh, shit, and see James running past me, and I hear my cousin saying the same thing seconds later and running back down to the truck. I'm last in the liberty, confused since information is barely reaching me, but my cousin and stepbrother are running for their lives. Remember it now, getting pitch dark, and as everyone else except me has turned around, making their way back to James's pickup, I start hearing branches or sticks breaking. By now, I'm the only one who hadn't turned around yet, and it's only been seconds. So I hear sticks, maybe branches, breaking, and something is making its way towards me, and it's picking up speed. I then around now, filled with fear, and run as fast as I can down the slope. I tripped on an exposed tree root and sprained my ankle, but I don't stop and continued my way to the pickup. This thing was close behind me. Now I'm about five, maybe ten feet away from James's pickup, and all the guys were in it yelling at me to hurry up. I dive onto the bed of James's truck. James steps on the gas and peels out as fast as that V6 can take that tiny S10. All I can hear is, did you see that? What the hell was it? James is saying, yeah, and I don't know. I and Brian were asked, what did they see? James couldn't answer because he wasn't sure neither could my cousin. They both just said they can't believe it. Now I never saw anything, nor did my two other friends who were behind my cousin. Just James and Lalo saw it, and they never elaborated on what they saw. Maybe they couldn't believe their eyes. I was maybe 25 years old at the time, and today I'm 52. I only knew of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and Yefos. It was only five years ago did I first hear about the dogman. I know there is another dogman encounter surrounding the Houghton Lake area. Did they see a dogman? I don't know, but this is my experience and belief that they did. I don't talk to my stepbrother or my cousin Lilo and haven't in 15 years. Still, I can't help but think about what exactly did they both see. When I was in middle school, I coon hunted a lot, mostly with my dad, but I knew the hills and the hollers enough around our home in West Virginia that he would let me take friends. I could go anywhere I wanted or the dogs led us, but I was told to shy away from this one old home place up in the hills. See, before the government owned it, my great-great-grandmother's people owned it. She lived to the age of 107 and died when I was 15. She would always tell us if the dogs head to the old Rooney place, come home, the dogs will come out on the other side of the creek, or backtrack you all back out. No use, you go fooling around that place. Well, one night, me and my friend Nubs, he's got nine and a half fingers due to a log splitter accident when he was ten, decided that we were going to hunt that hollow exclusively. Had to be a prize grade, a coon up there. Nobody hunts it. 
We took off up the creek road on foot with three of the best dogs I've ever had, Jake. Big, broad, blue tick with a cold nose. Slim Jim, hot-nosed red tick. And Trapper John, mean, bedeviled, extremely talented hound. Now you know when you get to the Rooney place because it's this big flat at the end of the creek road with big half-dead field trees and piles of field stones about every 30 feet at random for about half a mile that gradually turns up into a draw that peters out in the face of the mountain. This is before GPS collars or any of that stuff. I used my dad's old carbide lamp to walk by, and Nubs would use his dad's old wheat miners, light to spot way up in the tree. We would let the dogs run till we heard them bellowing our those long, bald barks to signify a tree and walk to the dogs and dispatch the coon. About five hundred yards ahead, with a short chase, the dogs barked treed. We started walking towards them up in the mouth of the cove. Then the dogs took off again. This is not unheard of. A coon can jump tree, come down another, and sneak off, and a circling dog picks up the fresh track, and off they go again. This happened six more times in the next two hours. That was definitely weird. And then everything went silent. That's when I started shaking. I knew my dogs. I've watched two of them fight bear. Nothing scared them. All the dogs came back to us with tail tucked head low, quiet as hell. We were working on an exit plan when, you know, when you shake a tree limb that it's rained on all night and all the raindrops fall off all at once and hit the ground. That happened about 20 yards behind me. Only this was a big rock oak, about 75 feet to the first limb. Well, we were trying to see what was in that tree. Damned if the same thing didn't happen to the tree we were standing under. When Trapper John pissed himself at my feet, I knew we had to get the hell out of that hollow. We backed out of there and ran home as fast as we could. Never hunted near the Rooney place again. I can't say for sure what was in that tree, but to me it looked like a man running through the treetops. It was years before I ever ventured in that place in the daylight. Did a little digging at the courthouse when I was in college. Come to find out it was a logging town when the Spanish flu came through. Had a mill and everything. The flu killed so many people in that town that there wasn't enough living to bury the dead. My hometown's people went up and buried the dead. If you take a black crayon and a piece of paper and scroll it on the biggest rock of the pile, it's names of the dead buried there. My great-great-grandmother's dad bought it for four fifty off the lumber mill, burned the last of the structures, and farmed it for the rest of his life. When he died, my great-great-grandmother and her brothers sold it to the government. It's part of the Monongahela National Forest now. This was two decades ago. They used to do donkey tours in the Grand Canyon. You ride the donkey and then hike. You can camp, but we did the day tour. A woman that was probably in her late sixties, early seventies was in front of me and on an incline started to act strange. She was swaying left and right as on a steep cliff, which was very safe and wide. It swayed back and forth for maybe a minute and she was slumped over and then boom. It looked like she passed out and pulled the donkey to the left and fell over the cliff. I saw her tumble over, and then they were just gone. I can't remember how far down the fall was, but it had to be over 100 feet. Immediately, the guy had jumped off at the front, ran over and let out an audible scream before stopping after realizing she had a tour with her. A few people got off their donkey, and she stopped them from peering over. A few of the other guides looked over, and they made some radio calls, and then we proceeded. It was very obvious that something really serious had happened, but we never found out. I'm pretty sure I watched a woman and a donkey fall to their death in the Grand Canyon. During a 2010-2011 West Pass on a ADDG, we were somewhere in the Indian Ocean. This is my best guess, because I was in the air dead on the ship and never quite knew exactly where we were. 
One night after flight ops had ended me and two other guys from the detachment were lounging on the flight deck. We had brought out those collapsible camping chairs and were just sitting there stargazing because the view was amazing with the ship not having exterior lights on. As we were looking at the stars, I noticed a pale green star moving east to west from our perspective. The best way I can think of to describe this would be that it looked like it is satellite except this one was a pale green color and had what I can only describe as three bars in front of it. Basically, it looked like a pale green Wi-Fi signal icon traveling east to west in the sky. The bar closet to the satellite was the smallest and the next two increased in size, exactly the same as a Wi-Fi icon. All three of us on the flight deck saw it and had no idea how to explain it. My best guess is that it actually was a satellite, but I can't explain the color or the bars The radiated outward in front of it. I know it was not a meteor or something similar, as it maintained a constant speed across the sky and was the same brightness the entire time we were able to see. That was without a doubt the most unexplainable thing I've ever seen while on the ship, and to this day I still have no idea what it was. I was having a fire with some friends in northern Minnesota. Everyone was pretty drunk and talking really loud, but I saw one of my friends freezer like he was hearing something. A few seconds later, another friend freezes like he's hearing something too. But this whole time, I can't hear anything but my drunk friends jabbering away. I am the only one who notices the two getting up and start moving into a huge clearing where we were camping. Once we get out of earshot of the fire, I hear it too. I don't know how to describe what I heard. It was extremely loud, like a low-flying plane, but it was more high-pitched and the tone undulated at a really creepy interval. The sounds was traveling at a high speed across the landscape, and every five seconds the tone and undulation frequency changed. It probably covered two miles in thirty seconds and we could hear it traveling west out of earshot. Never found out what it was. My father used to be a helicopter pilot down the south of New Zealand. When he was starting out, he would do a lot of deer shooting in very isolated spots of the country. Only recently he told me about a pretty creepy experience he had during an evening flight as he was making his way back up the country. He flew with just a spotlight, which I'm thinking would be illegal these days. Anyway, as he was approaching this small town call, Hast, basically in the middle of nowhere, he saw a bright green light in the sky. Not sure how far away it was, but he said he could hear it over the sound of his own helicopter. He said it disappeared pretty quickly after seeing it. He never reported it or anything, as he didn't want people to think he was crazy. My mom lives in the middle of nowhere. Her house is pretty far down a secluded gravel driveway that you wouldn't even know was there. The closest neighbor is about a half mile away. One morning she was up at about 5 a.m. getting her day started when the dogs outside started going absolutely nuts, which they only do whenever someone is on the property. She tried looking outside, but it was completely dark out. Later that day, the sheriff called, his friends with my stepdad, and told them that in the early hours of the day, a man had killed his wife and was running from the cops and had abandoned his car in the woods a few miles down from where their house was. He apparently accidentally stumbled upon their property when trying to cut through the woods. They caught up to him a few miles down and had a shootout with him, and he was killed in the process. I've been an officer in our small town since well before I can even remember, but I have never experienced something quite similar to what I did last week. I don't believe in the paranormal or anything of that kind. I never have, but the logic I've been raised to apply cannot begin to explain this. I have never quite seen something as strange. I'm not sure if anybody else has either. 
You see, there is no rational way to try and explain it or even make it sound plausible, but please bear with me. I need to tell you the story that changed my perspective on my life. At around 8 p.m., we had gotten word from dispatch about a dispute taking place between some college kids. Apparently, it had begun as a minor disturbance and soon turned into a full-fledged physical fight. The scene was a good one. Our drive, even if we drove like NASCAR racers. It was taking place at the literal border of our area of jurisdiction, so I was sure that we were going to be plenty late to the party. No other units were available at the time either, except for us, so we got moving. This is precisely why cops get a bad rep for always being late. You know, the units nearby are always busy with something for some reason. Gene, my colleague, and I drove as I sat in a seat beside him, looking out the window and listening to my growling stomach. I hadn't eaten lunch that day due to work, and I'm not somebody who can go a long time without eating. At around 8.30, still a rather large distance away from our destination, we stopped at a drive through sandwich place that had come our way. We were going to be late anyway, so stopping for a few moments couldn't possibly hurt. I would not have been surprised if the fight was already over by now and everybody had just gone home or to the hospital or whatever. I unwrapped my sandwich as Gene resumed the drive. He only had bought an iced coffee, despite me telling him to grab something to eat while he had the chance. He had been with me and had not had lunch yet either. My guess was he was not hungry anyway. There we were once again, driving through the empty road in silence. The road had thick trees on either side of it and completely void of people. It was pretty peacefully, actually, minus what it followed. At around 8.50, I noticed something weird out of the ordinary. The road had been straight all this while, but somehow we passed the sandwich shop that we had bought our stuff from once again. I pointed this out to Jean, who stopped and checked. Yes, we had been driving straight on a straight road for the last 20 minutes and somehow traveled in a circle. It was that very same sandwich shop. I told him to put it on his GPS if he doesn't know the way. He reluctantly did, swearing that he had been on this road multiple times and confidently knew the way. Once again, we left the shop behind us and continued the journey. I was rather observant of the outside this time, so when the long road lined with trees opened up to reveal the same shop, I couldn't believe my eyes. Gene had noticed it too and pulled over. He checked his GPS, but sure enough, we were again back at the same place. I couldn't understand it. Even I had driven on this road before, and it was not, and I promise, a circular path in any way. Something wasn't right. As he mumbled in confusion, I explained to him, Please let me drive now. It was 9.10 p.m. already, and he was repeatedly coming back to the same spot. This was not helping us. Looking carefully at the GPS on his phone in front of me, I began to drive. Even though I paid as much attention to the road in front of me as I did to the GPS route showing me a straight path to the destination, somehow we ended up by the shop yet again. I started freaking out. What is happening here? I looked at Gene, who was clearly as disturbed as I was. I couldn't just radio into dispatch and tell them we were going through some sort of time warp. They would think we're high or on drugs or drunk, so I had to think of something. I got out of the car and went to the owner of the shop. He was an older gentleman in his later sixties, the same one, actually, who had given me the sandwich. I told him about the weird thing happening with us and asked if somebody else had experienced it before. He was rather hard of hearing, so I had to repeat myself and raise my voice quite a few times. When he finally understood what I was trying to say, he looked clueless and simply shook his head. I walked back, disappointed. The conversation had not been fruitful in any way, and we drove off yet again, swearing that if the road somehow led us to the shop once more, I'd finally radio for the backup we needed. Keep in mind that I was plenty creeped out at this point, and so was Jean. At this time, however, the road lined with trees and went on for longer and did not lead us back to the same point. When I saw the connecting roads branching out from the one we were on, 
I felt a sigh of relief coming on like I'd near had before. Granted, we reached our scene by 9.50 p.m. and did not see a soul. But honestly, I didn't care. We had somehow been driving a circle on a straight road for over an hour, breaking out that there was more than enough time for me as Gene spoke to dispatch. I set the location in the GPS for the station, rerouting it so we didn't have to take the same path. No way in hell was I going to go through that again. As an officer, I have seen many weird things, but I have always been able to somewhat explain it with reason and logic, irrational thinking, the strange animals, strange shapes, the paranormal, possessed people, people on drugs, gunfights, you name it, people are strange. However, something like this that feels like we were in the twilight zone, I don't know how to describe this. I've looked into this before, and the only thing that comes up is the Mandela effect, which might or might not be part of what I experienced. Either way, it's hard for me to even comprehend and acknowledge that it really happened. The GPS and my memory both are a testament to the linearity of the path we were on, yet we had somehow been looped over and over again and talk about the Twilight Zone. Let me know what you think. I would love to hear your opinion on what you think happened. Thirty-five years ago, I was perched in a valley tree stand during archery season in a, an attractive hardwoods near my parents' home. This tract bordered on of the state's largest mental health hospital. Growing up in the area, youth kids would build forts, etc., in the woods surrounding the hospital and occasionally run into patients who wandered off the hospital property as it had no fences. Most of the folks were harmless, but this facility did house a number of folks who were truly disturbed. Anyway, getting back to being perched in the tree stand one evening, I got that strange sensation of being watched. That feeling proved to be correct as I saw a figure moving through some thick brush on the hillside about 100 yards in front of me. Thinking it to be just be one of the wanderers, I, I didn't pay it any mind for a few minutes. Upon just beginning to relax, I was again overwhelmed with that feeling. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man walking on the storm sewer cut behind me about sixty yards. He was wearing sweatpants, typical of the hospital patients, and a blue flannel button-down. I wasn't sure if he had seen me or not, but I had a feeling that this man wasn't one of the harmless patients as he began to pace back and forth along a thirty-yard length of the cut speaking and cursing loudly to no one, bawling his fists and hissing, spitting like a cat. It was getting close to sundown, so I thought it best to climb down and slip out of the woods, knowing I had a steep hill climb back to the house and didn't want to alert this man to my presence as he was between me and my way out. I waited until he had walked in the direction away from me, lowered my bow and pack, climbed down and started to do a long loop up and slightly around the hill in front of me. I dropped out of the woods against a pasture field, crested a short rise, and was surprised by the same man sitting on a fallen tree, massaging his bare feet with no shoes anywhere in sight. Mm, I remember thinking there's no way that guy could get here before I did. I was stuck and had no choice but to go by him. As I approached him, he looked up at me with eyes like Vincent D'Onofrio's character in the bathroom scene in full metal jacket. As casually as I could, I said hello and kept walking by. As I passed, he asked me if I was in the army and on maneuvers. I said no and kept on walking. Behind me, he hissed loudly, and that put a hop in my step. I went about 100 yards before looking back behind me. The man was gone from the fallen tree, although I didn't know which direction he had gone. I double-timed it up the hill and out of the woods towards home. Spooked me enough that I didn't go back there any more that year, and not long after, the land was sold and a housing development sprouted up. While the man may have been harmless, his actions and me, being an 18-year-old kid at the time, still make the hair stand up on my arms as I type this.
This story was told to me by my uncle, who happens to be a park ranger in Ontario. He frequently comments on how calm his work has been after pandemic, with fewer tourists visiting. However, there are still instances where he has to venture into the wilderness to check on things. One day he had to navigate through the woods with a colleague due to reports of unauthorized individuals in the area. These reports were not uncommon, usually involving mean-spirited teenagers causing trouble. However, what made these reports peculiar was the description of people carrying unusual items like axes and animal skulls. It was just weird stuff, and my uncle knew that people could be pretty racist in those parts. Speculations arose that these individuals could be Algonquin people, as the park was situated on their land. The thought of unhinged people worshipping Odin in the cold wilderness of modern-day Canada seemed far-fetched, but my uncle couldn't ignore the strange occurrences. As they ventured deeper into the wilderness, they discovered odd symbols carved into tree trunks remnants of trash and markings on the ground. It appeared that people had been actively camping in restricted areas. However, despite their efforts, my uncle and his colleague never encountered any campers during their patrols. But there were always weird things left behind, like a cape, a helmet, and even a real sword, as if someone had been indulging in Nordic cult practices. There were also traces of incense and other religious paraphernalia. These findings only added to the mystery surrounding the area. One night my uncle and his colleague decided to set up camp near a massive elm tree for shelter against the frigid winds that plagued the nights. They enjoyed a meal of heated beans and rice while exchanging stories. They maintained communication with a portable radio to stay connected with the base. At one point, my uncle excused himself to relieve himself in the woods while his colleague remained by the fire. As minutes passed, my uncle realized that his colleague hadn't returned. Concerned, he called out for him, but there was no response. The atmosphere in the woods had become eerily quiet, devoid of the usual sounds of the night. A faint whisper caught my uncle's attention from his right side. He strained to listen and moved in that direction, guided by the weak voice. It sounded like his colleague, but something felt off. The woods seemed too calm and quiet, giving my uncle an unsettling feeling. He called out to the voice, growing stronger as he ventured deeper into the wilderness. Then he heard his colleague's voice calling for help. However, my uncle sensed that something wasn't right. The tone and modulation of the voice didn't match his colleague's usual manner of speaking. It was an instinctual feeling that urged my uncle to proceed with caution. Armed with his rifle and flashlight, my uncle scanned the area, searching for any sign of his colleague. Instead, he came face to face with an unimaginable sight. Standing about four or five meters away in a small clearing surrounded by tall trees was a tall, genderless figure. Its thin frame and moose-skull-like head with antlers made it clear that This being was not of this world. The creature moved closer, emitting distorted and crackly sounds that mimicked his colleague's voice. Fearing for his safety, my uncle fired a warning shot into the air before turning and running as fast as he could. The unearthly noise that followed him was unlike anything human. My uncle ran until he realized he was lost in the dark wilderness. He had to wait for daylight to find his way back to the trail, relying only on his dying flashlight. When he finally reunited with his colleague John, it became apparent that John had experienced a similarly unsettling night. When my uncle returned to the campsite, nobody was there. John had heard my uncle's calls during the night and had also encountered strange noises that he couldn't quite comprehend. Concerned for my uncle's well-being, he waited anxiously for his return. In the morning, my uncle emerged from the wilderness, exhausted and disoriented. He recounted the events of the previous night to John. He listened intently, his worry growing with each passing word. They both believed that what they had encountered was something supernatural, possibly a wendigo. Although my uncle was not particularly religious or inclined to believe in such things, he understood the importance of respecting the rules of the wild. In the depths of the wilderness, 
where the line between reality and the unknown blurs, he realized that there are forces beyond our comprehension. From that day forward, my uncle and John never spoke of their encounter to anyone else. They carried the weight of that experience, knowing that some things are better left unexplained. The incident served as a reminder of the mysteries that dwell in the depths of the wilderness, hidden from the prying eyes of ordinary life. Even now, as time has passed, my uncle remains haunted by that encounter. The memory lingers, a constant reminder that there are realms and creatures beyond our understanding. It has changed him, instilling in him a deeper respect for the unknown and a sense of awe for the vastness of the natural world. Though their story may seem unbelievable to some, those who have ventured deep into the wilderness understand that there are things out there that defy explanation. My uncle and John carry their experience as a testament to the mysterious and uncharted aspects of our existence, forever changed by their encounter with the supernatural. I'm going to remain anonymous for this, but I had a signing of something that I can't explain in 2011 springtime. During the time, I was working as a police officer for a small town in northwestern Oklahoma. What made me take an interest in this particular case was the description given to me by the witness. It sounded just like how other witnesses have described other abnormals to include Sasquatch. I had one individual coming to the department as they were reporting what they thought they saw. It appeared to be a man with long black hair, no shirt or clothes, standing near their pond at about one o'clock in the morning. Apparently, it looks like they were holding a knife or some sort of weapon. As he noticed them looking out their window, he began walking into the wood line, disappearing from view, nonetheless never returning only after several attempts of trying to find him by the reporting party. I'm not sure what he had actually had in his hand. I never asked him a description of it specifically, but I began to do some research on my own. I came across several websites dedicated to Bigfoot sightings where individuals could almost describe perfectly, with many others, what they had seen. In my years as an officer before retiring from law enforcement, I've come across multiple reports of unusual creatures being seen all throughout Oklahoma, as well as neighboring states. In fact, just last year alone, I had another retired law enforcement officer tell me all about an experience that their own individual mother-in-law had while she lived out on a farm near Elk City. She told him about a time she had gone out to her chicken coop and had a face-to-face -face encounter with a small monkey-type animal standing on two feet without hair. It looked like it was wearing pants. It began making loud sounds before running away. It appeared as if it had jumped over multiple fences, only to disappear into the tree line. I also know that many people have reported seeing humanoid creatures looking similar to how. Bigfoot looked and how Bigfoot is described. All through various areas all around Elk City, Shawnee as well, and even the town I grew up in, Guthrie, where witnesses and victims claim these creatures prey on livestock, chickens, goats, pigs, everything. This is also not the only time I've received reports involving unusual creatures that match what has been described by the witness to include Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I'm sure these things happen all the time throughout the United States and even other countries throughout the world. However, I'm most familiar with Oklahoma, and it appears to be designated for many areas of things like this. I really doubt a lot of these stories are made up. If you got a chance to sit down and talk to these witnesses, they're terrified. Something is happening here. What could these creatures be? How does somebody prove their existence without anyone ever actually catching one? Do they really exist in different forms? The Smoky Mountains National Park felt like a universe away from the concrete jungle of New York City that I'd always called home. The air was cleaner, the quiet more profound, and the sheer expanse of wilderness was mind-boggling. 
Ancient trees like sentinels stood tall, their leaves whispering secrets of centuries in the wind. The forest floor was a symphony of life, crackling underfoot with every step I took. My name is Rebecca Miles, though everyone calls me Becky. I was assigned to this park as a part of my community service sentence for a minor infraction. My task was simple, to monitor the illegal logging activities that had recently spiked in the area. But the reality of it was far more complex, and soon I found myself entangled in a web of events that felt straight out of a science fiction novel. It started with strange sightings, rumors whispered among the locals about a creature that resembled the mythical Sasquatch. I brushed it off as local folklore until one evening when I crossed paths with the unimaginable. There it stood, a hulking figure covered in thick fur with eyes that held an uncanny intelligence. The encounter was brief and terrifying. It disappeared into the forest, leaving me with a racing heart and a newfound realization. The Sasquatch was real. The situation escalated when the creature, or creatures as it seemed, there was more than one, started to show signs of aggressive behavior. Reports poured in about sightings near local communities of livestock missing and of an inexplicable fear among the residents. It dawned on me that the Sasquatch, like the other animals in the park, were losing their habitats due to the illegal logging. I was faced with a challenge unlike any other. Not only did I have to expose the illegal loggers, but I also had to pacify the Sasquatch and find a way to restore their habitats. The days turned into a blur of tracking the loggers, collecting evidence, and studying the patterns of the Sasquatch. The task was perilous, and many a time I found myself narrowly escaping danger. Finally, armed with enough evidence, I reached out to the police. They were skeptical at first, but the undeniable proof made them swing into action. The illegal logging operation was busted, and a plan was put in place to restore the damaged parts of the forest. The Sasquatch, however, was a more complex problem. With the help of local experts, we managed to locate and confront the aggressive Sasquatch. The encounter was terrifying and intense. It ended with the Sasquatch's death, a resolution I was not entirely comfortable with, but was deemed necessary for the safety of the local communities. The police, while grateful for my help, made it clear that the existence of the Sasquatch was to remain a secret. They threatened me with serious consequences if word got out about our discovery. As I returned to my small cabin in the heart of the forest that night, I couldn't help but feel a sense of loss. I had entered this park a city girl with a punishment to serve, but I was leaving with a profound respect for the wilderness and its secrets. I had hiked in 15 miles to an alpine wilderness and just laid down for the night when a youngish guy in shorts and no bag pops out and asks me if I have water. I of course shared my water. He immediately said he had been hiking since yesterday. Apparently him and his friend went way back and off trail, skirting some cliffs along the way. Then he just says half jokingly, yeah, his brains are everywhere. I laughed half acidly. But he was sending off a really deadly vibe, not dangerous, just stone-cold shock. I asked him to clarify that last part, and offered him food and a cigarette. I also ordered him to sit down. He didn't want to because he would lose his legs if he sat now. But I explained he needed to sit a while. Long story short, his friend slipped and fell, and when he hit, his head popped, and then his body got wedged in a crevice. The guy I was talking to had spent all the previous day hiking around the cliff to find his friend, then had to hike out of the valley up the ridge and down again, all on Taylor slope off trail. He was absolutely shredded, skinned, tore up. He was begging me to come with him and help me get his friend out of the hill. That's the part that really stuck with me. He got up and was about three feet into the bush when I grabbed him gently and said, Hey, I got a phone. We'll see if emergency service works. Somehow it did, and I have zero idea how, technically or otherwise. We were standing in a glacial cratered alpine lake 15 miles from the trailhead. 
I got rescue up there, and man, I was super impressed with their response. Within a few hours, the first group of volunteers were passing my camp. These guys all looked like supermen, and they were. All night afterwards, a constant stream of rescue volunteers. I stayed camp and made a comfy spot for them to rest on the way down. They had to wait up there in white-out conditions for six nights, but rather than leave, they kept a constant vigil over the hiker's dead body. When the weather broke, a chopper flew in and took them all out. I've never been so deeply moved and impressed with that kind of selflessness in something we regard as a hobby, a sport, words that take away the very dangerous nature of it. Read all these stories, and it seems most are deaths by slip and fall. Happens too easy. Don't take the chance with your life. I've always been a pragmatic man. I didn't believe in tales spun around campfires or the whispers of shadows that live in the corners of one's eyes. I was a straightforward guy, a military man who enjoyed a good beer and didn't bother much with the supernatural. I was from Spain, but had moved to the States as a kid. I went to high school here, joined the military, and ended up stationed near the border. My Spanish came in handy, and I would often cross the border into Mexico. It was in Mexico that I met her, the woman who would become my wife. Back then, she was just my girlfriend, a beautiful enigma who I was just beginning to unravel. Her father was an enigmatic man himself, a drafting teacher at a local college and a firm believer in the paranormal. I thought he was crazy with his talks about UFOs and death, but he asked me one day if I believed in death. I told him we were all going to die. He clarified, no, the actual grim reaper. Do you believe in it? I laughed it off, thinking he was just trying to rattle me, but he was serious. My girlfriend, now my wife, was quiet as her father asked me what I would think if he showed me a picture of death itself, the grim reaper. I didn't know what to make of it. My girlfriend just smiled at me, or her mother chimed in from the kitchen, and I was sitting there in a foreign country with people I barely knew, thinking I was caught in some bizarre horror film. He offered to show me the picture, and despite my growing apprehension, I agreed. He returned with pictures, postcard, sized and flipped over. He began to explain how these pictures came into his possession. A friend of his, who owned a camera shop, had called him urgently one day. A man had brought in a picture of his brother on his deathbed, taken in the forties or fifties. He wanted the picture restored, and when the picture was blown up during the restoration process, the grim reaper was visible at the foot of the bed. My heart pounded in my chest as he finally flipped the pictures over. What I saw was just as he described. The man lying on the bed, the flowers by his side, and there at the foot of his bed was the figure. A dark robe with no connection to the ground, skeletal fingers clutching a stick, a skull peeking out from beneath a hood and the stick topped with a sickle. I felt a chill run down my spine. My blood turned to ice, and I had to look away. I couldn't sleep for days after that. I was stationed in a barracks on a base, and every time I closed my eyes, I saw the picture. My friends noticed my unrest, and when I told them the story, they didn't believe me. I even invited some of them over to Mexico to see the picture, and they were as shaken as I was. To this day, I can't forget that picture, and I haven't seen it since. The Grim Reaper was real to me in that moment, as real as the picture that I held in my hands. I had been a skeptic, but that experience shook me to my core. It was a window into a world that I had chosen to ignore, a world that was as real as the one I lived in. It was a chilling reminder of our mortality, and it was a memory that would haunt me for the rest of my life. Last night, there was a storm that hit Alabama. It started raining really hard around 4 p.m. and started getting really bad around 5 and 6 p.m. There was a tornado that hit Jefferson County, if I recall correctly. 
So before all that, at around 2.30 p.m., I went outside to feed the dogs when I got a text message from my sister. Hey, my battery died again. I'm at the water plant. My sister's car battery sucks. There's a water plant not far from here. So she pulled over. I got there boosted her battery and she went home. I wanted to go to the store, get some chips. Now my road is extremely backwoods. When you're on my road, it's like driving in a forest. I got some chips and headed back home, and by this time, it's 3.15. It's starting to get cloudy, dark, and some rain. At 3.30, I was finally almost home, just going through all these crazy turns. It's pretty common to see a deer or two pop up, so I was driving around 25 miles per hour around this curve. When I saw this thing... It moved, ran like a monkey, was naked like a person, blue pale skin, long limbs, short body, a small skull, not too small, just small enough it didn't look like it belonged. If if we're to stand, I would believe it to be about six foot tall, maybe a little shorter. I slammed on my brakes, but by the time I came to a stop, it had already ran into the woods. It didn't look at me, it just ran, got home told my sister. She thinks I'm pulling a joke on her. I'm just like I have last night, and today I'm still not sure what the hell I saw. I like to hunt. I got guns, but I'm not brave enough to find out what it is. Does anyone have any idea what that was? This was in North Alabama. Is anyone from around here that's seen it? I don't know if I'll ever see it again, but if I do, I'll post again. If I see it again, I'll try to take a picture. In late September 2002, I was camping by myself near Williamson River Campground. The area where I camp is one of many traditional campsites used by members of the Klamath tribes along the river. On my way in, I drove through the nearby campgrounds to see if any were occupied. As they were not, I continued on to my camp, confident that I would not be disturbed for at least one night. After setting camp, I caught my dinner ate and settled in for a relaxing evening with my fire. It was very dark still, a little chilly and very quiet that night. I remember considering turning in for the night as my fire had burned down to embers, so I checked the time. It was midnight, exactly. At that moment, I heard a large and heavy object hit the surface of the water with tremendous force. I would estimate the distance of the splash to be about 30 feet away from my fire pit. The object came from the opposite side of the river. The object did not dislodge and roll down the bank as I would have heard it tumble down into the water. Also, the bank is such that if this large object were thrown by a human, it would have struck the bank at least once before reaching the river. Whatever threw this object, I determined to be a large rock, was very strong. I became immediately alarmed, realizing that I was not alone. I did not allow my instinct to flee, drive my to panic, although I was very frightened. I rationalized it could be one of two things that threw the rock, Sasquatch or a very large wild person. In either case, it was apparent to me that I wasn't welcome there that night, even though I had camped there many times before without incident. I decided the best thing to do was to leave as quickly as possible. Before moving from my seat, I reached for my sidearm and fired around into the air to let whatever it was know that I was armed and scared. I then hurried to my vehicle, started the engine, and illuminated the opposite river bank with my roof-mounted spotlight. I saw nothing. I then quickly broke camp and left without further incident. I did retrieve the object in question a couple of weeks ago. It is a large volcanic rock of awkward shape and weighs in at 34 pounds. It was exactly where I remember hearing the splash and is the only rock of that size and shape in that section of the river. I never considered myself an ordinary man. Roy Anderson, a dedicated family man and an avid hunter, was my name. Each year, as the vibrant colors of autumn painted the landscape, I eagerly awaited the time, 
honored tradition shared with my hunting friend. We would embark on a thrilling excursion into the depths of unknown woods to pursue the elusive deer, testing our skills and strengthening the bonds of friendship. This year, our chosen destination was a secluded forest nestled in the Appalachian Mountains, renowned for its haunted past and tales of missing persons. The air was thick with anticipation as we gathered our gear and set out, our hearts pounding with a mix of excitement and trepidation. The stories we had heard about the forest's dark history only fueled our desire for adventure. As we delved deeper into the forest, surrounded by towering trees and enveloped in an eerie silence, a sense of unease began to seep into our souls. Unbeknownst to us, we had inadvertently strayed into uncharted territory, a place shrouded in mystery and inhabited by an unknown force. It started subtly with whispers on the wind and fleeting shadows that danced at the edge of our vision. But soon, the malevolence lurking in the depths of the woods made its presence known. The forest seemed to awaken, vibrating with an otherworldly energy. Fear coursed through our veins as we realized we had become prey in this dark game. And then we saw it, the cryptid, a creature that defied explanation, with six legs and standing at a towering height of eleven feet. It appeared as a monstrous hybrid, combining the ferocity of a mountain lion with the raw power of a bear. Its presence was both mesmerizing and terrifying, as its eyes glowed with a sinister intelligence. The forest became a battleground, the thrill of the hunt replaced by the desperate struggle for survival. Each of us fought valiantly, but the cryptid seemed to possess an uncanny ability to anticipate our moves, as if it were toying with us. We realized that our only chance lay in confronting this formidable adversary head-on. In the final moments of our harrowing encounter, I found myself face to face with the cryptid, Determination surged through my veins as I summoned all my strength to deal a decisive blow. I struck, unleashing a mighty attack. The cryptid let out an agonizing roar, and I believe victory was within our grasp. But the moment was fleeting. As I fought to maintain consciousness, the world blurred around me. When I finally awoke, the sun was beginning its descent, casting an orange glow upon the forest. Panic gripped my heart as I frantically searched for any trace of the cryptid's body, but it was gone, vanished without a trace. Confusion and disbelief clouded my mind as I pieced together the fragments of what had transpired. How had I survived? What had become of the cryptid? The forest offered no answers, its secrets buried within its ancient gnarled trees. Now... I am left with an unforgettable tale to tell, a haunting reminder of the unseen forces that lurk in the depths of the unknown. A buddy and myself rode our bikes up the road to check out the old helicopter pad which we had been told of by our neighbors. As we got the top, we heard hard stomping, almost like there was the different animals up there with us. About ten feet from us, we heard a loud crack, and then a madrone tree started to shake violently. The It stopped, then again the tree shook. My firing and I thought it was a joke, so we picked up a rocks and started to throw them in the general direction of the tree. We scared it off for a little while, but then the tree stared to shack, and a rock was thrown back. We decided to jet fearing a bear or something else. As we rode down the road, we could hear one on each side of the road, stomping almost like chasing us out of the forest. I have been up there four times since then and find it imposable for the tree to shake as it did. But since then, I have had two more encounters with the stomping beast in that general area. Last day of a week, long backpacking trip in the Canadian Rockies. I was about 15 minutes ahead of Dan when I came upon a literally steaming pile of grisly scat in the middle of the trail loaded with berries. I made sure that my bear spray was handy and walked on. Maybe 30, 40 yards down, I was in some brush when I heard a rustling to my right. 
I stopped, grabbed the bear spray in my camera. Then a grizzly, eight, ten feet tall, stood up on its hind legs less than ten feet from me. But just as quickly it dropped down and ran off like a quarter horse and disappeared. I got a bad photo in a racing heart. I was getting home late with my older sister. Uh, I'll call her Sarah. It, it was around 10, 10.30. My parent told us to go grab some things from the backyard as a windstorm was coming. For reference, we lived in a trailer park at the time, and there was a giant hill in our backyard that hit a power plant. I always hated going in the backyard at night because there was no light. Sarah said she thought she heard a noise, but we assumed it was our dad. Sarah called Dad and our dad came out of the house. We didn't panic because there were stray cats everywhere that could have made that noise. Our dad went inside, and we started towards the door, and I stopped when I saw a deer-like figure run on its hind legs to the hill. I wouldn't have thought much of it if we lived by woods or something, but we lived in a trailer in the middle of a super-populated town. My sister saw it too, and we could never figure out what it was. I just recently learned about skinwalkers and don't know much about them, but think this could possibly be one. Any opinions? I was staying at my uncle's house in India in the country for the summer. He was gone for the summer, so I was house-sitting. A lot of weird shit happened over those couple months, and I have no explanation. Weirdest of them all was the one I'm about to tell you. It was monsoon season, so the power was going out a lot. He had a room situated in the back of the house on top of a garage I was staying in. It was not connected to the house, so I didn't have an inverter. So on to the story. One night, the heavy wind came around Nightmum and the power went with me. So I decided to go into the house and go to the room that had power. No ache, but a fan is better than nothing. At the time, I had a set of DVDs of The Sopranos and was watching it on my laptop. This shit still gives me the freaks. But I went into house, locked the door behind me, went into the room, turned on the fan, and then the light. The light turned on and then flickers and burns out. I didn't give anything to that because I had this huge flashlight with me anyways. So I go to the bed and turn on The Sopranos. The Sopranos is a really good show, so my mind was completely focused on that. Nothing could bother me, but then out of nowhere, I heard something I have no answer for. Somebody or something was in the house. Sounded like the smacking of slippers on your feet while somebody walks around. It happened right across the room's door, too, so it scared the shit out of me because I thought somebody might have gotten inside. But I remember locking the doors, so I was confused took my flashlight and decided to go with the sword in the room and yelled, saying, whomever is to there, come out. You got one chance. Nothing but silence and the sound of the fan from my room. Remember, this is India. Robberies happen quite a bit out in the village and people will kill you. That's no joke, so I was scared to death. As I'm about to leave the room, I hear the fridge in the kitchen turn on and the power's back and the house was completely empty. Also, the doors were still locked. Still have no idea what that was. But after this strange shit started to occur, like faucets running in rooms that I wasn't using, but I also don't believe in this stuff, so it never really bothered me afterwards because the power did go out again the next couple of days, and I went back to that room still. I am an avid outdoorsman and I have a few stories for you folks that are from my past experiences. I'm going to start with one from a few years ago. I was on a hunting trip with my dad on some land I owned in a very desolate part of a neighboring county, perfect right. Well, here is what happened. We get to the access road, albeit was more of a logging trail from days gone by, but my 4 by 4 could handle it. So we get to the stopping point of the access and park the truck. I'm getting ready to get out when Dad decides we need to stay at the truck for a bit. He said something along the lines of not having a flashlight. 
when in reality he wanted a bit more sleep, fine, whatever, right. After about 30 minutes, I couldn't wait anymore, so I woke him up and we proceeded to get ready. Dad had just put his gun over his shoulder when we heard a blood-curling scream off in the distance that put us both on edge. I was ready to leave, but Dad talked me into going on our way. He assumed it was just a bobcat or a fox. I was nervous, but I was also carrying a 36 with 220 grain loads and a 45, so I figured I could handle myself if need be, plus Dad was armed as well. So we hit out, and we made about a 400-yard hike when we saw it. It being a deer with its entire throat ripped out and blood everywhere we quickly but carefully left the area guns down and loaded. I have personally seen coyotes attack a deer, and going for the throat isn't there. Well, they go for the quarters and drag a deer down. The only thing we can come up with is a big cat of some sort, although mountain lions no longer live in the area due to overhunting or at least that's what we have always understood to be true. I don't believe in Bigfoot or the like, but moments like that really make you wonder. While working on the Riceland Rail Facility, I had gotten stuck in a patch of mud after some light rain the day before. I was surprised that the mud was different from the rest of the dirt road and went back to investigate why I got stuck. Upon walking to the mud patch, I noticed something that didn't belong. Sticking up out the mud was huge bone. Its color was something I knew, just a gut instinct was human. I collected it up and reported it to the company safety, saying that I believe it was human, and upon a quick Google search, deemed it highly likely to be a human femur bone. After a couple of days, I was curious as to why police never showed up and if it was turned over to the proper authorities. He said he just chucked it out his buggy on the way to the foreman's office. Said it would have seriously delayed the project and that the Bayou's held a bunch of mysteries. Said that the reason the mud was so soft was that they had dump trucks bring in more fill dirt to level the road and that a bunch of bodies go missing into the bayou. I was shaken as I was not from the area and torn between my morals and wanting to make it home in one piece. There was a bunch of stories of people working there tied into the mafia and people finding bodies in the bayous all the time. Even once had a neo-Nazi come up to my work truck to explain that there was a gas line not marked via traditional GPS surveys. I told him I wasn't the guy and that the office was down the road a bit. I called my mom for advice, and she said that I had to do what I have to just to make it home for my wife and kids. My friend Mel and I were up panning for gold. He was on the left side of the road, and I decided to walk up a small stream on the right side to see if I could find anything. I was about 75 yards and standing on a log that had crossed the stream taking a rest when I smelled a musty smell and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I turned around to see something take one step in the middle of an eight feet stream and to the other side. It was six, seven feet tall, brown and black, longer arms with slight hump back. At that time, I unholstered my sidearm and put a round in the chamber. I just stood there for a couple of minutes trying to see or hay or anything to no avail. I slowly made my way back to the road through the thick brush the same way I had come in and told Mel what I had seen. He didn't know what to think. I have been in the mountains my whole life and not seen anything remotely close to what I'd seen that day, although I have smelled the same musty smell on other occasions while out in the bush. There were three of us, Mary Jane Robinson, her mother Dorothy Robinson, and my, myself. We were in rural Pennsylvania, Shippensburg, and Cumberland County. We went shopping in a mall that was a few miles from home. Mary was getting ready to go to nursing school. She was buying a few things, and, uh, the stores closed at 9 p.m. We were coming back from Shippensburg, and Mary hated driving on Interstate 80, one, so we always took the rural back roads. 
It was a perfectly clear night, a million stars visible in some moonlight. And it was just, you know, a lovely drive. Then, out of nowhere, there were these lights that came up behind us, and Mary thought that somebody wanted to pass. So she put her arm out, and she said, pass, pass. And she slowed down, and they didn't pass. But they were close, and it was annoying her. So she stopped the car, and she said, I want to find out what is going on. And her mother said, Mary, don't get out of this car. Just stop. Let them go. Ignore them. And she said, no, maybe something's wrong. Ever the caregiver, Nurse Mary. I was in the back seat. I got out of the car as well. Mary was 18 and I was 14. So I got out of the car also and I was on the passenger side of the car. Mary was on the driver's side of the car. She walked to the rear of the car and I was already pretty much there. And there was this object. There was no lights this time. When we stopped and got out of the car, the lights were gone. And you couldn't even see where there had been headlights or anything. It was perfectly smooth. It wasn't square. It wasn't like oblong or like a hot dog or anything like that. It sort of had a rise in the center from the top as though it rose and the bottom appeared to be flat and the sides were curved, but very smooth. There was not a sound at all, Mr. Bell. Not an engine, not a hum, not a nothing. It was absolutely quiet. Art asks if she was frightened. No, because we didn't feel threatened. I mean, I actually touched it. I was so fascinated with it because I didn't know what it was made of. In later years, I came to realize that it was like titanium. It was perfectly black and the moonlight made it look shiny. A starts rushing her as always, asking if they took off or whatever. No, we did not take off. Mary starts asking, Hello, do you want to talk to us? I'm not afraid. And I said, I'm not afraid either. I said, would you like to speak to us? Would you like to ask us questions? We'd like to answer your questions. Don't be afraid. We're not afraid. We were kids, you know. Now Mary's mother is in the front seat crying hysterically. Get in the car. Get in the car. I, I don't like this. I'm frightened. And Mary's just, ma, ma, shut up. This is the thing that was amazing. It just lifted straight up without making a sound. It just elevated as if to go up and while it was right in front of, I mean, I wasn't a foot from it and I could put my arm out and touch it and it just lifted straight up and just sort of took off. And as it took off, lights around it started circling different colors and we could see people inside and we waved. We waved goodbye. Art ass, human or non-human? They were too far away but they appeared to be human. They had heads, necks, shoulders, arms and the one thing that Mary said was they don't have five fingers. And see, I wasn't looking at the fingers. And um, we were waving to them saying goodbye and they waved back to us. I was archery hunting here in Virginia at our hunt club, set up on top of a ridge with a lot of buck sign, about 20 feet off the ground. I hear something coming up the ridge from a swampy area. Here comes a mama black bear and three cubs. So was a big mature sow. She walks right to the base of the tree. I'm sitting in and stops dead and starts looking around. Obviously caught a whiff of where I walked in. So she stops, and the cubs, of course, are oblivious to what is going on. The cubs start playing on the tree. I'm in, and I'm, I'm thinking one of them is going to climb the tree. Not good. Now I'm starting to think I'm in deep dew. If a cub climbs the tree and starts bawling or something, so one of the little dudes gets on its hind legs, paws on the tree. Now I'm thinking I may have to take the saw, even though I don't want to. Bears are in season, but still. Just about that time, feel a little breeze, which lets the sow catch a whiff of me. Hair stands up on her back. She wheels around and woofs, heading back the way she came, with the startled cubs tagging behind her.
To set things up, me, 19 female, and my boyfriend, 26 male, both have extensive experience in the woods. I hiked across the Pacific Trail from Ashland to the Bridge of the Gods at the border of Washington, and that took six weeks. I've always enjoyed the outdoors, and I've never felt unsafe, even when getting close to wildlife such as bears. My boyfriend grew up in a rural area surrounded by farmland, so he's also comfortable with the outdoors. We decided to go camping at a lake, which is about 45 minutes away from Yakima, Washington, and this region of Washington has an abundance of Native American land, history, and Native people, of course. Not sure if it's relevant, but I, I, I thought I'd add it. We end up getting to the lake at about 10.45 p.m. As we pull into the entrance, I immediately get a bad feeling. I have only felt something like this a handful of times in my entire life. I tell my boyfriend, basically, this place is giving me a bad vibe. Man, and he says, I'm just scared of the dark, utterly dismissing my feeling. As we round a curve, I'm struck with the reality that I've had a dream about this place. His car, a Crown Victoria, the specific shape of the road, the light from his headlights. It wasn't deja vu. It was straight out of a dream I had when I was maybe 12 years old. I tell my boyfriend I've dreamt about this place, everything about it. I go into more detail than that, but you get the idea. In my dream, there was a pale, creepy face with reflective eyes staring at me through the trees, and I just remember running as fast as I can from it down the road. Again, he considers what I'm saying, but ultimately disregards it. We pull up to the campsite and set up pretty fast. Maybe 15 minutes and we've got our tent up, a fire going, and my boyfriend has a cigar lit since he's terribly addicted to the nasty things. As we sit around the campfire, he is puffing away, and suddenly we hear this wildly loud screaming. It sounded like a group of college kids screaming their drunken asses off, but it didn't sound quite right, if that makes sense. It sounded like men and women screaming in perfect unison, the high and low screams melding together. I instantly try to rationalize the strange sound. It was maybe a mile away, just over a hill, possibly. Moments later, we hear it again, but on the opposite direction, and it's closer, now probably a half a mile away. I swear to God it sounded more disturbing, realizing that sound is not human at all. I don't know if it was more distorted and alien, or if the proximity allowed me to hear it better. We begin to quietly discuss how that sound is not normal. Neither of us in all of our years of hiking and traveling have ever heard something remotely like that. Moments later, the sound is not further than a football field away. My boyfriend puts his cigar down, grabs his gun, and we agree to ignore it and no longer speak of it for the rest of the night. We hop in our tent and wake up to a gorgeous sunny day. His cigar was missing that next morning. We talked about it a bit that day, and it still freaks us out thinking about it. I believe that when it sounded far away, it was actually very close. These creatures have an ability to sound far away, when really, they're not far at all. I heard from some people that the further they sound, the closer they are. Thoughts, feelings, opinions, story is 100% real, by the way. My friends and I like to go camping when there's a lot of snow out because it's just different and really isn't too bad, as long as you know how to pack for snow and properly layer. Another reason we really like to go then is because there's so few people and we like to shoot guns and the less people there, the less complications that go with that. With that, he'll explain what happened. Myself and two of my friends, we will just refer to them as Chris and Dean, went out to find a spot to park our vehicles and hike out a bit in the snow to find a spot to camp up on a mountain that was just past the southern part of Rimrock Lake, past the airport a bit. We find a spot that is clear of snow that snowmobilers use to park their trucks and unload their snowmobiles. From there we see a trail that doesn't look like it has deep snow, 
So we decide to go down it a bit and see if we can get closer to the mountain, since it would be a lot less walking. We make it about halfway there, and both Dean's' jeep and my truck get stuck, and we can't get them out at all. We decide to go up the mountain a bit and see if we can get cell service so we can call Dean's uncle, since we knew he owned a recovery rig he built for the snow. We go up, bringing our rifles with us, and we come to a clearing with some piles of wood pallets. Dean's phone gets service, and he calls his uncle and said he can come help us out, but probably won't be until morning since he's out of town that day. We tell him it's fine since we were staying the night anyway. So while we're just hanging out, we decide to staple some paper targets to the pallets to shoot at since it was a good area with a backstop to shoot. We shoot for about 30 minutes and hear a scream like you described, but it sounded pretty far away. Chris doesn't really camp that often, so he was commenting on how weird it was, and my, myself and Dean were like, uh, probably just snowmobilers around or something, even though we didn't see anyone near us at all. We keep going until it starts to get dusk, and we hear it again, and it sounded closer. We all kind of looked at each other, acknowledging that it was weird, and decided to head down to where the vehicles were stuck and set up camp there since Dean forgot his sleeping bag in the jeep. We start walking down again, and the scream happened again, but in the opposite direction. We start to move a little bit quicker down the hill and get to our vehicles and start setting up tents and everything. We're in the middle of that when the scream happened again, but sounded close as fake. We all stop and look at each other and decide to grab our rifles and look around. At this point, it's pretty dark, so we really couldn't see much, but myself and Chris had weapon-mounted flashlights on our rifles, so we just turned them on and started scanning the area, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. After that, we didn't hear it again. Next day, Dean's uncle came out and pulled us out of the snow. We tell him the story. He's been going there for like 30 plus years, and he said very nonchalantly, yeah, that shit happens. I don't know what it could be, but that's why I just bring a high-power rifle. L-O-L. I, I heard screams like that before, but I always thought it was just people partying in the woods since it always happened in the spring or summer. It happening in the winter when there is feet of snow was spooky since there really isn't a lot of people that camp out there during that time. Since then, it's made me rethink if it really is just people partying in the woods or something else. I don't know what it could be, but it is very strange, and like I said at the beginning, I just chalk it up to the woods or just spooky like that LOL. I live in a very small town in Kansas, and last night I woke up to every dog in the town barking. Then all of a sudden something started making a noise like I have never heard before, and all the dogs got quiet. This thing sounded like it was three or four blocks away, and then within a second it sounded like it was in my backyard. I could hear it moving outside my house. Then it would sound like it was blocks away again, and it just kept repeating the howl it was making. It kept doing this for about 15 minutes. My friends and I decided to meet up for a casual chat in the park one afternoon. We were strolling through the woods, enjoying the fresh air and the sounds of nature when we came across some abandoned toilet. At first, we didn't think much of it. It was just another sign of urban decay, a forgotten structure lost in the midst of the woods. However, as we walked around to the back of the toilets, we saw something that made our heart stop. Through the blurry glass, we could see what looked like a figure, an arm, and a hand dangling in the air. It appeared as if someone had hanged themselves, or worse, been hanged. It was a terrifying sight, one that instantly filled us with fear. We stood frozen in shock for a moment before deciding we needed a second opinion. We didn't want to jump to conclusions, but we couldn't ignore what we were seeing either. Spotting a passerby, we quickly called him over and asked him to take a look. We wanted to confirm if we were just hallucinating, or if there was genuinely something there. To our growing horror, he saw the same thing. 
His daughter, who had been trailing behind him, also saw the same chilling sight. At their suggestion, we decided to report the matter to the police. The seriousness of the situation was sinking in, and we knew we needed to act responsibly. We quickly made our way to the local police station, where we gave them our details and explained the situation. They assured us they would send an officer to the location as soon as possible. As we left the police station, we couldn't shake off the eerie feeling. We had gone out for a simple meet, up a walk in the park, and ended up stumbling upon something so chilling. The image was burnt into our minds, and the fear was still palpable. I promise to keep everyone updated as soon as we hear back from the police. We can only hope now that it's not what we fear it is. It was a typically quiet morning when I got a call from Jeannie, a resident who lived about 30 miles up to El Boulevard. I've known Jeannie for years. We grew up together in the same small town, and she's always been the type to keep to herself. So when I heard her voice trembling over the phone, I knew something was wrong. Something's been here in my driveway, she stammered, her voice shaky. A huge footprint in the mud. My brows furrowed in confusion. A footprint, Jeannie? I echoed, trying to comprehend what she was saying. Yes, it's, it's massive. I ain't seen anything like it before. I assured her I would be there soon and quickly set off in my truck, driving the familiar route up D.L. Boulevard. As I turned up Boundary Road, my mind raced with possibilities. Could it be a bear? But Jeannie's house was a fair distance from the forest's edge. Perhaps some pranksters trying to give her a scare. Pulling up the driveway, I saw Jeannie standing there, her face pale and her eyes wide with fear. She led me to the footprint, and my heart skipped a beat. There, embedded in the mud, was an enormous footprint. It was much larger than any human foot, and it had a peculiar shape that was distinctly non-human. The toes were long and had sharp, claw-like protrusions at the tips. The heel was broader than any creature's foot I'd seen. I knelt down beside it, my mind racing. I had been working as a park ranger for over ten years, and I had seen all sorts of animal tracks. But this, this was different. This was something I had never seen before. As I traced my fingers over the imprint, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Whatever had left this footprint was huge and potentially dangerous. It was my duty to find out what it was and ensure the safety of the residents. In the following days, I led a team of experts to examine the footprint. We cast a plaster mold of it, hoping to identify the creature that had wandered so close to human habitation. We searched the nearby woods, looking for any signs of this unknown creature. But all we found were more questions. The footprint became a local mystery. Some said it was a hoax. Others believed it was a creature from local legend. But for me, it was a reminder of the unknown that still exists in our world, a mystery that I am yet to solve. Every day as I patrol the woods, I keep my eyes open, wondering if I'll come across another such footprint, hoping that one day I'll come face to face with a creature that left it behind. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.